one, two, one, two, three. Because you're listening to Jams and Tea, you want to see the show on your TV. So we talk about things musically. Because you're listening to Jams and Tea. You're listening to Jams and Tea. Welcome to the first episode of the Jams and Tea podcast where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah we dabbed. We, we did a dead meme on the first <laughs> fucking podcast. This is a great start. Um, what we're here for, we, it, you know? we are here because we are, are, are five uh, pals who like to talk about music. And so, of course, why don't we just go on the internet and talk about music? Because, you know, any schmuck with a camera can. So why not? And this week is our first episode. Uh, where we are officially going to introduce ourselves to the world so you can get used to our boring, beautiful faces. And we are going to briefly go around and explain the the gist of this. We are going to cover two recent releases uh, uh, for records, talk about some contemporary things. And at the end of the episode, there's going to be a record recommendation. And yeah, that's pretty much it. And since we are doing this in the order, because this is technically an acronym that, for, for our show, just because just the stars <laughs> just happen to align, uh, I will be beginning first. My name is Jake. Um, I am 22. I live in Kentucky. And I'm we, an alcoholic. And <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, I look to my right and I'm just like, there is an empty bottle of bourbon and amaretto so that is maybe true but hey Al- all good alcoholism, all, what? Who, alcoholism and who music st- tangentially al- created um i have i I, I have no specific alcohol on a podcast <laughs> oh yeah why of course why would anyone take any type of substance to, to get ready for a podcast <laughs> <laughs> anyway um my musical taste is pretty much anything uh, anything goes. I have specific inclinations towards maybe variations of progressive rock, uh, experimental, and electronic music. Uh, specifically, um, my favorite band, for example, is Porcupine Tree, uh, the progressive rock group. Uh, and I just, I just really like everything. I just like, con- like, just consuming all of the music I can possible. And that's pretty much it. That's just what I like to do. And uh, I'm a writer, if that makes any difference. So, you know, take my opinion with a grain of salt. So now let's move on to the A in jams. Oh, boy. And August, the only man yeah. whose face is not visible. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's... I was about to say, you said we'd have to get used to everyone's beautiful, boring faces, but nobody's going to get used to August because he doesn't have a fucking web. Because he's shrouded in mystery. Yeah. It's because he's broke. He's just protecting, he's protecting his identity. Yeah. The CIA who want to murder him. Yeah, true. I mean, so, yeah, CIA are after me. I'm uh, August, obviously. <laughs> I am a... Uh, it's an assumed name. Yeah, obviously. an assumed name. I'm a he got it from uh, Robert Forster from Breaking Bad. <laughs> Mm. He lives in Alaska. <laughs> filthy. All right, filthy. We, we should let the man talk now. At this point, I'm a filthy Midwesterner. So that's one thing. Uh, musical taste wise, uh, I stole pretty much everyone here's musical taste. <laughs> I, I pretty much hijacked it, but then added a, a twist of of ambient to it. Yeah, um, which conveniently I've been on a kraut rock kick lately. Not surprising. Most, no. most on brand thing. Yeah, <laughs> I've ever heard. And uh, I guess the one other thing is I am also a uh, prolific enough music producer. I make the my own jams, so you can criticize those if you want, podcast listeners. Oh, yeah, you've got a new album coming out, too. Yeah. So you yeah, can sort of get back here it. and tear it to fucking shreds, of course. No, there's, not white. No, there's, there's no criticism here. We're just hype, man. Yeah. Uh, right. You know, that's, you know what? That's album. the thing, though. All of August music is good, so I can't really, like, talk yeah. shit. So, <laughs> yeah. sorry. Yeah, new album on the uh, 12th of June for Glacier Flower. That's exciting. Beep, 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 I, didn't beep, beep, beep. Was, I didn't even know it was so soon. 
Oh, yeah, shit. we'll have links for everything, like singles and just projects of, uh, of ours in the description below. And also just before we proceed, uh, because current events are being what they are, we are also including some charities that you might want to donate to because of things happening in places like Minneapolis and where now Morgan and I live. The shooting was in Louisville, which is about, you know, 30, 35 minutes from where we live. Uh, so we're going to include those in the bottom. We actively encourage you to uh, donate to that. So, you know, thank you. Support appreciated. Yes. But anyways, speaking yes. of people in bands. I'm, I'm not in a band. I thought you, you were. You were in a band. You have an album. It's a very it's, good right. album as well. Okay. Well, it's, it's, thank you. Um, was <laughs> in a band, past tense. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm. Morgan, I, I used to play in a thrash metal band because I'm a loser. Uh, uh, musical taste wise, I guess I lean like absolute favorite stuff tends to be stuff in the punk variety. Like my favorite bands, the Menzingers and pretty much everything of that ilk is stuff I lean towards, but also like post punk hardcore and post hardcore are also very much up there. But broadly speaking, I'll, I mean, I give anything a try. Just, I mean, it doesn't mean it always works on me. Because As today will demonstrate. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. a lot of the time it doesn't. Uh, or it is just yeah. as likely to listen to Converge as he is Carly Rae Jepsen. So. Yeah, uh, I don't I do. think you've actually told them what your name is yet. He did. Yeah, he did. I did. He did. He did. He did. Oh, did you? I'm wrong. Ignore oh, wait, me. I didn't. I should it, say what my favorite well. Your name is not John Milius. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't say well, it. No, it's John Millius' stepchild. Oh, yeah. Okay. Forgive me. Forgive me. That's Millius. Is Millius is, is the middle name. August Millius. <laughs> <laughs> also, yeah. like how stepchild is two words. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Anyways, it's a quick thing before we presumably move on, unless you've got to say more, Morgan. Uh, favorite no, bands. I'm, My favorite no, bands good. are the ones that you don't understand the lyrics of. A la system of a down and the Mars Volta. The best the for those that don't have any lyrics at all. Yeah, yes. <laughs> also. Those are like the best bands that don't even write lyrics. Mm -hmm. Burial. Just I would, I would, um, a... <laughs> trying to start arguments right at the beginning. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now we've got someone else to talk. As yes. oh, that's me. Hello. Um, my name is Sersha. Um, that name, I'm, I'm a filthy Brit, um, colonialist pig dog. Um, my favorite kind of music is like, I, I said earlier, it's like, it's either angry people in their twenties with acoustic guitars or angry teenagers with electric guitars from the two thousands. Um, my the favorite only band, genres, frankly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, the two genders. <laughs> <laughs> what about angry teenagers with electric guitars in the 2010s? Like, what happened? They're, they're okay, they're fine. Um, but uh, my favourite band... Endorsement. Thank you. My favourite band is some Mountain Goats, sort of tied with Against Me. Um, and my favourite albums from recent years are like... Uh, I loved Split by Pat the Bunny and Cheshi. Um... I re uh, I've loved most of the Mountain Goats records, and I've loved most of Against Me's records, and plenty of I, I loved the last Laura Marley album to come out this year. Actually, song for our daughter that I thought that was wonderful. Uh, the last Mountain Goats record came out in April. I thought that was really good. Uh, they're returning to the kind of the beatbox acoustic guitar thing that they used to do uh, because the lead singer is stuck indoors like the rest of us. Uh, so that was really nice. It was nice It'll to be a recurring like, musical theme for for later. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was nice to see um, the how their style has evolved since then, uh, because the last one they did was All Hail West Texas, which is my favorite album of all time. Um, and it's nice to see how their style has developed when done in the same format, if that makes sense. Because it's hard mm -hmm. to compare a beatbox album to the full studio albums. But when he returns to a beatbox, it was really rewarding to see the more arty shit done like that. Yeah. Yeah, this, this um, being a Brit whose favorite album is about Texas. It's cultural appropriation, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, hey, you have been here. We've we we have visited one another. I've not been to Texas. <laughs> and America. <laughs> In the words of Simon and Garfunkel, we've all gone to look for America. That's true. I mean, if, <laughs> and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, your people invented cultural appropriation, so it only it only makes sense. Yeah, exactly. True. So personally, I don't I don't take the, the act of cultural appropriation in and of itself cancels out cultural appropriation. When you're <laughs> it's MDAS, is what we're saying. Yeah, yes, I mean, look, we yeah. fucking appropriated tea from India and made it a British thing, so. Yeah, it's true. Tyler's just anyway. like, I have to follow this fucking mess. <laughs> this disaster. Also, I'm trans. I'm trans. That'll come up a lot, I'm sure. Yeah. Let's continue. Wide perspectives here. Wide perspectives. Exactly, yes. So, uh, I am Tyler. I am the tea. In jams and tea, even though I don't drink tea, uh, which will shock many of you, I'm sure. Um, I'm from New Zealand, uh, in case you were couldn't didn't quite have your finger on it. Um, but yes, that is my accent. Um, struggling to think of interesting things to say about me. So I do listen to a lot of music, uh, <laughs> mainly because I don't have a life. So, that is true um, for all of us. Yeah. yeah. Do you? Yeah. Do you know? Do you know Taika Waititi? <laughs> yes, uh, have you seen Jojo Rabbit? Have you seen Have you seen that film? He is my father, as you can probably tell by the physical. <laughs> um, and at every family Christmas, I tell him how terrible his movies are. <laughs> um, just no, sits I, down so happy, and you're just like, I fucking hate you. I I have nothing but. I have nothing but respect for um, Taika Waititi. Uh, so yeah, anyway. He just lied. He just lied right to the camera. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> Director of um, Boy. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Hunt for the Wilder People. Boy. Um, two, that is it. two canonical classics of um, films. Right. So. Um, <laughs> just. Um, I completely derailed that intro. <laughs> Just complete sabotage. Yeah, yeah. Sabotage. Good going. Yeah. So anyway, um, Tyler. Anyway, um, Stan Jane Campion. All right. So my so i listen to a lot of music as well my tastes are fairly eclectic, um, just like Jake's and just like some of the other people in this um, room as well. Um, I don't really know that I have any particular, like, uh, I do have probably a few niches that I'm kind of like, if you speak to me at length about music for any amount of time, then you'll probably get a fairly strong impression of it that I have these niches. So I'm quite into, um, pop music, uh, specifically kind of like the current emerging wave of, um, bubblegum bass influenced hyper pop music is a niche that I really enjoy. Uh, and we're going to touch on today as well. Um, and I also enjoy a lot of the, despite how terrible of a, a label this is for a genre, I enjoy IDM music. Yeah. And a lot of, um, or as Oliver from Deep Cuts calls it, brain dance, which I think is a fantastic genre name. Um, but anyway, I, I enjoy, I was kind of raised on weird sort of electronic shit in the nine, and that came out in the 90s, even though I grew up in the 2000s. Um, my dad played a lot of like acid house and big beat and really weird sort of stuff that was kind of big for a short time in the nineties and then kind of got really outdated very quickly, but that my dad really never grew out of. Um, and so I think a lot of my interest in sort of weird eccentric pop music, um, is rooted in that because a lot of the current sort of trends you're seeing in that kind of alternative pop music are actually rooted in this weird nineties phase of developing electronic music. So yeah, anyway, that's a really long way of saying, I just like, uh, bleep bloop stuff um, yeah. but I, I, also enjoy, I also enjoy music made with real instruments too so you can put your pitchforks down I enjoy a lot oh, of um, I enjoy a lot of post hardcore and um, metalcore and generally any kind of like aggressively played rock music will probably get me going um, uh, yeah I'm, I'm currently kind of on a jazz phase at the moment I'm really into jazz. Um, yeah, so pretty much anything really, uh, except, yeah, 
ex, you know, I was going to say accept country and jazz as a meme. Um, not country and jazz, it's country and rap. That's the meme. Yeah. Sorry, I'm still waking up. Um, but I do like country and I do like jazz um, and, and rap. <laughs> really if any of you are home, it's okay, honey. You did a good job. If any um, of you yeah. at home are worried about the fact that Tyler has just woken up and I'm drinking beer, I want you to know we're on opposite sides of the planet. Like yeah, they, they, they are opposite sides of the planet. Twenty-four hour time difference. And no. August is over in the Midwest, and Morgan and I are three and a half minutes from each other. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, like eight yeah. miles. Yeah. I, I also want. I, I also want Tyler to know I would happily put down my pitchfork. I mean, have you seen the scores they give? No. <laughs> well, uh, gonna, if you uh, follow that my, if you follow my music account, you'll see that just yesterday I uh, updated the profile picture on the music Twitter to be a, a screenshot of um, the rating. That, oh, right. Specifically, the rating that Pitchfork gave to. Cold plays Viva La Vida, which is not a record I particularly love, even though it's pretty good, which was a 6.9. Yeah. Um, and it just was, yes. yeah, hey. it felt right to make that my um, picture because I think that encapsulates a lot of the vibe of my music Twitter. It's just a Pitchfork 6.9 rating of a Coldplay yeah. album. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I, can't, I can't explain it, but it fits. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm sure they'll come to know that as well, honestly, yeah. like as they acclimate and speaking of acclimating to, to tastes now we can it'll be a little bit more brief just because we're not introducing ourselves but we're gonna briefly just talk about the records that we've been spinning uh you know just other than the ones that we're talking about very very briefly and also just because this is the first episode i think we should passingly mention what our favorite 29 or not 2019 jesus fucking christ what our favorite 2020 uh album release so is so you're doing far. great yeah, thank you. Uh, I appreciate yeah. the encouragement. Um, and <laughs> no the, intoxication was uh, involved in this podcast. No, I'd none at all. Say. None. None. No Absolutely intoxication zero. was involved. No. In the slightest. But can you can you move the Stella logo like closer to the uh, yeah the we're camera sponsored. and just yeah just be like yeah this is spo- sponsored by Stella Artois. Um, Actually, I would much would rather weed. get sponsored by Ballantine's <laughs> finest Scotch blend and whiskey. I straight thought that was a bottle of barbecue sauce. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is brought Ranch, to you by brother. A1 Steak Sauce. <laughs> nice. Oh, Christ. Okay. So, <laughs> so what is you been listening to, Jake? Uh, let's stay on track here. So, Jake, so what, anyway. Uh, um, Jake. You yes. were listening to. Uh, I, I have been listening mainly due to uh, Tyler releasing, was it your just like favorite albums list in general that you had updated? Uh, um, probably. I was very, I didn't know where you were going when you said I released something. Because oh, I yeah. Like yes, Tyler's latest EP. Slightest. No. Yeah, my latest EP of ambient jams. He, he put me on to um, an album purely based off of the cover art. And that is uh, Everything Everything's album, uh, Get to Heaven, which I just somehow slipped past me whenever it came out. Like, I don't know why I didn't check it out, just because it's, it has been recommended to me before. But well, I've been listening to was, that. It came out in, like, 2015, so I don't yeah. think you were listening to music at the time. No, actually. that's Well, I mean, like, when I first got into music and was, like, listening to specifically that, that kind of record, like, mid-2000s, uh, like, canonical, like, beloved critical albums that just, like, did really well. Uh, and yes. for that, for whatever reason, I just never checked that out. Even though oh, everything, yes. everything is right. My favorite part of the mid two thousands. Twenty fifteen, not fourteen. The twenty tens. The twenty tens. Twenty fifteen, August. So how about you? The mid two thousands. Just My all point factual is invalidated. <laughs> it's again, PEMDAS cancels out. Uh, but yeah. I've been listening hey guys, to that so pretty much. Points laugh at August. Yeah, basically. Uh huh. But but I've been listening to that on repeat. Uh, just because I think that album's fantastic. Um, I've also been listening to, like, obviously the two albums we're going to cover. I've been listening to the albums that we're going to cover uh, on the next episode of this, which is uh, the new Jason Isbell record, Reunions, and um, the newest Perfume Genius album. Yeah, terrible, both of them. Uh, Not not, not a fan, not a fan. And um, uh, I've recently delved into Lupe Fiasco's catalog, which I really, really like. Um... And I've been revisiting some like older, like like '90s uh, hip hop, uh, Black Star by uh, 
most deaf and Talib Kweli, uh, most notably, and uh, some KRS-One. And uh, yeah, that's what I've been listening to. All right, so I'm going to keep what I'm listening to under the length of a novel. Uh, I've been listening to uh, Tangerine Dreams Records, Phaedra and Rubicon. Good, good albums. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the only thing I'm familiar with Tangerine Dream for is their soundtrack for Michael Mann's Thief. Thief. Yeah, so that's mm-hmm. good soundtrack. Uh, nothing. Good fucking soundtrack. I have nothing to add to that. Mm. It is good. Yeah. yeah. They go did with that one. Is that that's all you've been listening to, August? Uh. And I guess the new Nicholas Jar, uh, Senizas. Right. Mm. And uh, one other thing. Uh, oh, yeah, Stoner Witch by the Melvins. Mm, a classic. Yeah. So, classic. I suppose I'm next. Yes. Uh, yeah. I haven't, for like the past six months, I haven't been all that album listening focused, weirdly enough. I'm hoping this show will help change that, but recently in terms of albums, I've been listening to a, a progressive rock band called Marillion, which you may have heard of. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Stephen Wilson loves them. Well, of course he does. Yeah, it's, he's, of course. He's been cribbing from them for the last yeah. 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they have a record called Brave, which uh, for uh, comparison's sake, Jake will know what I'm, understand- what I'm talking about. Um, it sounds a bit like No Man. Like, that's just kind of what it reminds oh. me of. Just very, very okay. eerie, sort of s- deeply English. I don't know how yeah. to describe it as any other they, way than that. L- the lead singer, just like, his accent is detectable in his voice, like, very much I'll so. Oh, add that to the list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it depends on how you feel about uh, long-winded prog rock. Yeah, um, it's, it's some of their bigger records are a bit like trying, so you know. Yeah. Tread as, as someone who considers Tales of Topographic Oceans to be one of the best Yes albums, I'm definitely going to put a long-winded prog rock album on my rotation. This place, Child, is pretty good too. I haven't quite uh, made up my mind about the album as a whole yet, but what I have heard and consumed with some level of brain power is that it's it's mm-hmm. quite good. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's your recommendation. Do what? It's your recommendation. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Otherwise, I have also been spinning the crap out of Get to Heaven by Everything Everything on Tyler's recommendation. Uh, Yeah, that that album is like, I think more than half of it has fallen into my on-repeat playlist on Spotify. Yep. Just because I've been spinning those songs over and over and over again. And it's like, I want to get to their other records, but I feel like I just can't move on from this one until I have yeah. like Same. completely yeah. absorbed it. And after the, I don't know, like 50 listens in total that I've given it, I, yeah. it still feels like I'm not there. I, uh, I listened to Get to Heaven for the first time in 2016, and I immediately fell in love with it, like the two of you have. Um, and I listened to all of their, their, they had two other records at that time. I listened to them as well. But I didn't like fully a- appreciate or enjoy those records for like another half a year, I don't think. Just because I was just so like into this one record that I had heard from them first, Get Heaven. Like I was so, it was such an absorbing thing that I, and I couldn't stop listening to it, that I just wasn't able to, you know. Yeah consider the I mean, fact that they may have other music yet because I just wanted to um I just didn't want to listen digest to it that. fully and it's yeah, it's another it's, it's an, another thing as well is that it doesn't help that it even though they're one of my favorite bands and all their records are good it is clearly their best album like it's clearly the sound of a band uh uh making music on or firing on all cylinders yeah like arriving at a moment they had been building to so that uh, makes it difficult, I think, to, for any band when you hear something that's clearly that it does make it difficult to process and move on to the fact that they have other music as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just such a fucking good record. Uh, it's it's one of those records where like I have a different favorite track from it every day almost. <laughs> oh yeah. Like it just yeah. it just shifts like all the time, and like I'm finally yeah. getting to the point where I fully appreciate Blast Doors to the level that you all do. Yes. Except 
because that was one of my least favorite tracks for a while, but now I'm just like, this is just so horrid. I can't even, ugh. And like, it's still, even then, it's on the bottom tier of what I consider my favorite tracks on that album. But it's, ugh. It's just it's such a consistent record. Mm-hmm. It's the gift that keeps on giving. And what's your favorite 2020 release so far? Oh, well, that's, that's kind of a spoiler because Nick, we're covering oh. it next week. It's, it's uh-huh. Jason Isbell's reunions. Because, I, I mean, what, what could possibly be more on brand? I mean, not a thing. Nothing. Not at all. I, am, I, I don't forgot fucking to... love it. Jesus. <laughs> I mean, honestly. Yeah, August and Jake, did you guys say what your favorite records of the year were so far? Oh, oh. I didn't. No, um, I didn't. Yeah, August, what's yours? Uh, I think I've I've probably made this clear to you guys, but I, I'm pretty much in love with the uh, the new abnormal by the strokes even yeah. though i hate yeah, the strokes just... <laughs> as a band i love that album that's that's my number two for the year i haven't listened to it yet i'm, I'm anxious it's, to get to um, it though. it's definitely not the worst strokes album <laughs> what a yeah, glowing okay, recommendation funny. considering because... that it's probably their best yeah i would yeah i would agree yeah <laughs> wow <laughs> it's just it's uh, anyway, probably think... it's probably like my fourth favorite strokes record and i like Jesus. it a lot what do they have like five <laughs> they... <laughs> wait no they have six now so oh, uh, i would i would rank phrase. them i would rank them is this it then room is on this fire. it is this it is this it then room <laughs> on fire then angles then the new abnormal then Come then first impressions of Earth and then come down machine. And the only one of those I don't like is come down machine, which is just fucking bullshit. Just yeah, it's really terrible. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I digress. Angles above the new abnormal. Ugh, I... Angles is a good record. Like it's, it's short... good. It's fine. It's <laughs> just not the new abnormal. This is, that's yeah. me listening to the new abnormal. No, this is fine. This is very like pa- passable music. Well, Your passable music. With some highlights. <laughs> well. Uh, well. I think, I think that's my turn then, isn't it? Mm, yeah, it is. Oh, wait. Um, my, my, favorites, yeah, uh, my favorites, the, no, the Weekends can't. After Hours, uh, is my favorite record nice. of the year so far. I'm just I'm just I watched a movie the other day. It's very good. Um, yeah. The I movie that was cannot... evidently based off of the Weekend album. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's made in what, 1990? None of, us, none of us could have possibly more on-brand picks for favorite albums of the year so No, far. really. Yeah. <laughs> been oh, so you just wait for mine. I get the moody atmospheric hip-hop album with lots of pop bangers. Yeah. That's on-brand. No, I, I have the Dirt Emo. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jake has the Brockhampton core. August <laughs> has the weird Brian Eno-esque sort of post-punky thing. Uh, <laughs> Tyler has uh, what's Tyler? I haven't seen mine yet. I haven't seen mine yet. Oh. So, so yeah, it's, it's going to be on brand. Let's not. Hello, let's I not do. Run. I do exist and have a turn. Yeah, yeah. My favorite is the twelve-hour Ortega live album. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Did I say Especially it was going to be on brand? It's not. Um, although that is good. <laughs> um, right. But I'll I'll reserve mine until after Sasha's had her turn. Yeah. Yes. Go Thank ahead. you. Uh, so I needed to like just go to the loo for like five minutes and I've been waiting for my turn so I can get it over with um, but right, like, um, one more thing though like one <laughs> <laughs> I would just like to uh, pass before we talk about the first album I would just <laughs> like to throw my hat into the ring of saying that um, everything everything record is fucking amazing uh, spring summer winter dread is my bop every summer I love it oh hell yeah but no, um, uh, I forgot to say in my introduction that I too make the music. I released an EP last year, and I'm like halfway yes. through an LP. A great EP. Mm-hmm. A really good Thank EP. Mm-hmm. It's right. called mm-hmm. The James EP. It's by my oh, yeah. band that's just me. I did a Foo Fighters. I did a Nine Inch Nails. It's just me. It's called uh, Social from the Gender, and the EP is The James EP. Mm. has a killer uh, Radiohead cover on it. Thank yeah. you. That I designed, actually. That's true. Yeah, August designed the cover art for it. Yes, um, very good cover art too. Thank you. Yes, 
Um, what have I been listening to? Um, I've been getting really into Ghost lately. Ah. Uh, mm. Sp- Spooky Abba. I I did not. That Jake told me that some called them that, and I didn't get it until I just started listening to them again like a week ago. And my God, the hooks! But it's about Satanism, um, yes. and I love it. Um, I've also been I listening almost, to. I almost wore my ghost shirt for this. Oh wow! Uh, wouldn't that have been amazing? I should have uh, worn my everything everything shirt for this. <laughs> we'll coordinate uh, next was, time. No, it's, I we'll, worn we'll, we'll chat about this. t-shirt design beforehand. Yeah. Um, I've also been listening to Joy is an Act of Persistence by Idols a fuck ton. Yeah. Um, Banger. When I was in Kentucky, Always. Jake showed me Never Face a Man with a Perm. And again, like I was like, this is cool. I didn't quite get it. And then I listened to it again recently and I was just like, what the fucking shit? This is amazing. Um, and I began to love it more when I looked into what the lead singer intended to say with it. It's like um, a critique of toxic masculinity and like... Uh, making a parody of, um, of toxic masculinity and uh, also of expressing regret at having so much toxic masculinity himself and um, getting in fights with these people when that, like the music video, when they're like, I hug it out, the gym lad and the lead singer like fucking make out and have sex in cartoon form, which is fucking amazing. And I love the song of the album, especially called uh, Samaritans. Yeah, uh, where the, it is the best and most wholesome deconstruction of toxic masculinity that a punk record could ever be capable of. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, it's still really boisterous and aggressive, and I love that the album is that while still being mainly about love. You know, um, yeah. I think that's really that's a hard thing to do for a punk band, and they did it, and that's really impressive. That's uh, a fantastic record. I, great, I great think, record. Like, every single track is brilliant yeah. on that one. Really Absolutely. good album. Absolutely. They they have a song about a fucking stillbirth that breaks my heart on that album. Oh record. yeah, God, baby that's shoes tough. for sale, never uh, worn. Which is a Poe ri- quote, I think. Yeah. I yeah. thought it was. Yeah. I think it always gets misattributed to Hemingway. Yeah, it does. Uh, well, it was he- Hemingway posed a writing challenge, and I think. Anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that, that song's about. Uh, Joe Talbot, the lead singer's like real life experience. Yeah. Oh Which fuck. Is... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, anyway, the, the the thing I find so interesting about the Idols record, in terms of its deconstruction of toxic masculinity, is how specifically English it is. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. It's the line "You're not suave because you watch Kit Carter." Like yeah. that's just. <laughs> I just, know. It just perfectly puts a picture in your head of like the dude always down at the pub in the track suit just yeah. screaming at the TV. It's what And I Danny Nadelko get... is the most left punk yeah. song I've ever heard. Oh, but like, I don't get images. Um, and, I'll, and I'll get into this again with the Charlie record, is that I know the people in this, in that song. Because yeah. I went to yeah. school, I went to school with them. Mm-hmm. And it's not like guys in track suits per se. It's it's guys who spend every uh, hour after school at the school gym, just and all the time. And it's like uh, when he says, uh, "Your one big neck, your one big neck with sausage hands." Yeah, that's like specifically yeah. referring to something that happens when you take steroids. You're um, not a man; you're a gland. Yeah, mm. oh my God. it's like I know these people. I went to school with them. And I was going through uh, the Facebook page of someone who bullied me when I was like 13. And it is him. He yeah, has yep. become this. Yep. Uh, uh, and I'll get into it with Charlie. It's like, I feel like the voice of the record that Charlie has, I have been to school with that person. Um, and that's part of my opinion on that record. But we'll get on to that. Because um, both of the bands we're covering today, or acts we're covering today, are British. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. So yep. that's, it's always interesting to me when I hear British sounds in media, be that like books or media or films. It's re- it's like I always find it so distinctive, but I can never put my finger on it. Um, mm. And it's like oh, I was listening to the new Jeff Rosenstock record, and I was getting lots of. Uh, there's one record that really evokes to Dead Kennedys, but aside from that, I was getting like yeah. huge 
sounds like British punk and post punk in it. Mm. Mm. Um, and well, it's something I can't put my finger on, but I know it when I hear it. Another interesting thing about the fact that both the acts we're covering today being British is that obviously they are both British, but they also have primarily, well, my perception is that they have primarily American fan bases. Yes, mm-hmm. especially Charlie. So, so their music, uh, while there is a definitely, I think, an debatably authentic Britishness expressed in both of them, it's interesting the way that it's kind of filtered through the mm-hmm. fact that the pop music they're so heavily influenced by is mostly um, American in lineage mm-hmm. and um, Absolutely. has a very American flavor to it. Um, so I think that's interesting. Uh, but we'll talk more about think, that shortly. I do think you are one hundred percent right. Has a has a quite heavy British following. Uh, so the nineteen seventy five. I would Morgan said that the nineteen seventy five. Do you have a heavy British following? And I think that's true. Sure. Um, but it was like, especially at the start of their career, it was mainly British. And as they've gone on, they've become more of an American band. In terms yeah, of yeah. And that's, that's, just a, an American band in terms of personality as well. Like, mm-hmm. if you look at one of the like biggest songs, like Love It If We Made It, like, the, primarily the issues they're talking about in, so- in that song are primarily American issues. Like, um, mm. and a lot of um, kind of what, because they're a very kind of obviously media focused and band or band that are like their whole thing is reflecting the culture reflecting they are the pop in every sense of that word and what it implies yeah exactly but i mean i think there's a noticeable um shift like you can see if you compare the new record not just, not just talking about sonically and genre wise but if you compare like the the writing and the sound of the new record to say their debut you can see that kind of shift away from a uh a Britishness, for lack of a better word, into something that's a little more kind of culturally homogenized. Yeah. Or um, if that makes sense, I hope it does. Um, because yeah, the 1975, the album, is a very British record to me when I listen yeah, to it. Yeah, mm-hmm. 100%. I mean, there's songs on there that, like, uh, The City and Sex, that really, and Girls as well, that really specifically touch on British culture and stuff yeah. that happens in, in, like, British teenage life. Especially yeah. girls, I think. Um, and that does continue on to the second record as well. Like, there is still, like, big British elements on that record. Like, the song She's American, for example. Yeah. Um, and a lot of stuff that they... Um, yeah. So I think it's interesting how after that point, after the second record, which I think is their best, as I've established, they kind of, that's where they started to lose me after that point, where they got a little right, more... Right. I, lost uh, I agree with Tyler completely on this. I mean, yeah, I 100% agree with I still like the elements of their third record, even if I think it's easily the worst thing they've done. And I like more elements of the new record, but it yeah. does lack a lot of the character yeah. of the band. I mean, it, it, it's interesting that the one big negative review of the new album I found was um, a one-star review in The Independent, which is a British paper. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, which I've read it. I disagree with some of it. I agree with other things. It's a good read, um, yeah. and it's short. But um, anyway, my favourite yeah. album of the year so far is Laura Marling's Song for Our Daughter, which is very on brand. Nice. So what have you been listening, listening to, to listen to that? So what have I been listening to? Uh, well, as I established earlier, I have no life at the moment. So I listen to a lot of music and I purposefully try to make the music I'm listening to on a given day as eclectic as possible. Um, so I have been listening a lot to Jason Isbell recently because I wanted to get properly into his music in, a, in the lead up to the new record. And so I've listened to including the new record, his last four records. I uh, mm-hmm. love them all really 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 enjoy the kind of um tasteful character and just really crisp songwriting on all of them that's uh it's he's an incredibly mature songwriter i really enjoy that aspect of his music uh i've also been listening to a lot of ween just to veer tyler core just to veer away from the uh immaculate immaculate maturity into music that's a little (laughs) more uh, eclectic in and of itself um I've been lis- listening to every single Ween record. I've gotten through the first five or six, and I'm really, really like one of my favorite bands at this point. I really love how diverse their style is and how deep their commitment is to subverting every genre that they do, while at the same time paying homage to them as well. Their music is, their music isn't like um, 
an ironic takeoff of like an ironic parody or a parody rooted in kind of a disdain or a desire to kind of like undermine the genre they're parodying. There's a real sense of humor about their music, but at the same time, there's also a sense of respect and a sort of a sense of admiration for everything they try to, all the genres they try to um, um, put their take on. So I really love their music for that quality. Um, I mean, yeah, what else have I been listening to recently? Um, I've been, uh, lots of bands, I don't, I won't get into too many of them, otherwise I'd be talking for way too long, but, um, but yeah, those are the two at the moment, like in the last week that, that I've been really devoting a lot of time to. Uh, and my album of the year so far is uh, Melee by Dog League. Uh, it's a Very punk good. rock record. Uh, On brand. Sort of emo, uh, uh, sort of third wave, Midwest emo, but also very heavily punk record. Um, that is really brilliant, came out in February or March and has been on regular rotation ever since. Just total um, firebrand, just intensity from the first second of the album to the very end. It's just one of the most economically um, well uh, written and recorded records I've heard in a long time. Um, but also that's another sort of niche that I really, really enjoy is just that kind of hard on sleeve um, emo stuff that's been kind of um, churning in the Midwest in America for the last 10 years. I really enjoy a lot of, a lot of that, a lot of those bands in that, in that sphere. And it's nice to see in the last few years, specifically certain bands like the Hotelier and Foxing and now Dog League, um, who ha are taking that style and also pushing it in a more kind of progressive and a more kind of um, uh, diverse direction. And Dog League's Melee is a great example of that. Yeah, I've also been digging that record i just added that's my 2020 playlist because i, I did not right. remember it of course I, you do yeah, i think it's an okay album you know yeah well, i mean i think all you really need to do is listen to the very first song kawasaki backflip and yeah that's a great that's song. A basically punk song all right that's basically kawasaki the record in a nutshell, nutshell that's the best song that they've written and if they write a better song than that they'll probably be one of my favorite bands Shit. yeah agreed yeah uh, that song's fantastic I don't know, that album, at least as far as I'm concerned, despite the short runtime, it kind of runs out of ideas towards the last two, three tracks. So, it gets a little long-winded, in my opinion. I actually don't disagree. No, oh, God. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. for sure, it's, um, it's, I just say it's, it's diverse, and, I don't, and it's not like diverse stylistically in the same way as something like uh, Foxing's Near My God is, or uh, or like a Jules Manor record, or one of those other kind of big um, sort of Midwest emo emo bands, but of the of this new wave of emo music. But um, it's just the performances on that record are so good. Like um, I wasn't expecting it to be so explosive, so consistently explosive in a way that is also really dynamic. I think in the way that it sounds, like every. Like it is very kind of it's not there's not a lot of stylistic variation on the record, but the performances are really tight, and it's just the right length for that to not get tiring for me, uh, and for when it finishes for me to want to go back and listen to it again. But I definitely understand how like if it's, if it's not like a specific niche you're into, then it could kind of suck, sound a bit one note. Um, but I mean, yeah, that's just. Perspective. I, guess. I mean, that's. I would definitely check that LP out because um, about a year ago, when I was in Kentucky again, actually, I was having a really big um, emo revival kick. Like, I was listening to uh, a lot of American football and a lot of Hotelier and a lot of um, this amazing band called Prince Daddy and the Hyena that I just adore so much. Um, so, I will definitely check that record out because I haven't yet. I think you will dig it. Mm. Thank you. All right. All right. I'm just going to go to the loo real quick, but you can continue talking. I'll be right back. Yeah, okay. So, so uh, now that that's happened, uh, I guess we can formally move on to the first record that we are going yes. to cover today, and that would be to see it. Uh, Charlie XEX, uh, her record "How I'm Feeling Now," which is in all lowercase. Oh uh, yeah. yes, all lowercase, which is fitting, just because it is definitely like a decidedly more 
uh, it's, you know, not, it, it's a bedroom pop adjacent album. In I, I mean, it, I doubt it's like authentic bedroom pop. But, uh, oh no! I mean, she's got too much money for that to be the case. But it's like it is a it is an album that is born from the fact that she has been holed up in her house for two months, yeah. and just decided to make a record with whatever she had lying around. Uh, like which, the front you know, cover is her in her bed. Yeah, just being like, "Hey, there's a picture of me," and it's there's just like, picture. "Yeah, click. it's just like, yep, yeah, uh, that 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 suits click, it." Click, click. And in terms of just like where it fits in her discography, I think it's. It's definitely interesting to see that this is the direction that she took after Charlie, because Charlie was a very, very critically acclaimed, very like widely regarded album. I'm pretty sure that's like the the gold standard for her right now is the sort of like the popular mm-hmm. canon sort of accepts that as her best album. Um, the, I'm just going to interrupt you there. I don't think that Charlie is widely accepted as her best record. Is it not? No, I think it's actually no. this album. Which is, is it well, not? It seems to be that it's becoming this album, but before this yeah. album came out, the one that everyone talked about within Charlie's sort of fandom world and also outside of it within the general critical world was the Pop 2 mixtape, which I guess and you could argue it's not I, an album, it's a mixtape. I don't like particularly album. like Pop 2 that much, honestly. I think right. it's okay. Like, I'm very so on and off with Charlie. Like, on an album by album basis, it like just, it, it, I, I am either hot or cold. It, it yeah. Well, regardless of whether you like it or not, it's generally seemed to be the kind of point where she arrived at the sound, the expression of the sound that was kind of first teased at with the Vroom Vroom EP. Yes. And then Which with the number one Angel mixtape, she kind of sort of started progressing the Vroom Vroom sound, but it was also very commercial in that record. And it was very kind mm-hmm. of um, clean and very kind of shiny. Whereas with Pop, when Pop 2 came out later that year, it's a very ugly sounding record that's yeah. probably not the best word I could choose for it, but it's very kind of grimy and very kind of like uh, a very kind of raw and just um, muddy expression of the, uh, of, or subversion of the kind of piece, the shiny PC music sound yeah. that she was kind of dabbling in up to that point. Um, and regardless of what you think of that record or not, uh, it was basically generally the consensus at the time was that it had a bunch of her best songs um, and that it was kind of like what people had been wanting from her ever since the kind of manic insanity of that Vroom Vroom EP. Mm -hmm. Um, um, So yeah, and I mean, I personally think that, and I know a lot of people are with me on this, but I personally think that Charlie is a better record than Pop 2 um, because it seems to me, it seems to me slightly um, to more fully reflect who she is as a person and all the different facets of her personality than Pop 2 does. Mm and perhaps, I mean, that's not maybe that's not necessarily a good critique of Pop 2 because um, Pop 2 is, and pretty much every other record besides Charlie, is not intended to be this kind of like um, uh, self-portrait necessarily. Yeah. A lot of um, the music on that, a lot of that kind of early period music is very kind of performative in nature, whereas Charlie is more of a kind of stripping bare of the facade and more just expressing who she really, really is, hence the self-titling. And what makes Charlie and then how I'm feeling now so strong and so easy for me to immediately connect with is how they're both rooted in that kind of um, lack of irony, total kind of um, uh, straightforward... um, Sincerity. Sincerity, exactly, yeah. And and yet she manages to capture... uh, or a, a, a reflection of herself that at the very least seems sincere while at the same time still using the same palette of sounds that she's been working with the same producers she's been working with for the last few years so i mean from my perspective she's gotten better with each record that she's done um I, it took me a while to kind of fully get my head around how i'm feeling now but i mean i think that re- on reflection and just considering it conte- both contextually in terms of where charlie's at um, structurally in terms of how the record comes together and then in terms of the songwriting I think it's her best album yet I, I actually uh, I'm as this this will not be the first time I say this on this show but I pretty much entirely agree with Tyler um, I actually <laughs> took to it um, like almost instantly um, just because I there's there's something about specifically the sound of 
um, how I'm feeling now that just, it is, it sounds like being drunk at a party you don't want to be at. And that is precisely the kind of sound that I look for when going with, with Charlie, because it's just, it is this very specific mood that is conveyed with this, this really interesting sound palette. And like, it immediately starts off like Pink Diamond sounds aesthetically like a death grip song just immediately smacks you in the face and you're just like whoa and then it just sort of like eases you in to that and it's just a really easy album to digest and considering that i have been locked in my house since february i have been listening to that album and i'm just like this is definitely how it feels to just walk around my house when it's empty and i relate to that and I, i feel like it is all of Charlie's best instincts. It's like the the thing for me with her last record with Charlie was that like, it just felt really front loaded with good songs. And then the second half of the album just drops off for me. Like, I feel like all of the tight production and all of the really good songwriting like happens in the first half of the album. And I feel like all of that is condensed. Like it's, this album's shorter. It's like, it's like right at 40 minutes. It's like, it's digestible. It's not like too bloated. It's just it's sort of like the, the Goldilocks situation for me of like all of her albums. I have like, you know, I've sat in the chair and I've been like waiting for the one to be, you know, this one's too tough. This one's too this, this one's too that. Yeah. And I feel like this, she has finally hit the sweet spot for me of the like eclectic sound of the, like the weird collage of, of noise and electronic production and the like, the, the, the empty sounding and like kind of just sort of out there uh, uh, lyrics that are just sort of like the, like uh, Charlie songs always sound like parodies. Like they're just always lyrically. Right. It, it's, yeah. it's always just, it's never about the lyrics. It's just always about how they sound. And it's like, and that I can completely understand being a turnoff for people just because they're almost completely vapid like half the time, like when she is not sad, her songs are about nothing. And I like that a but lot, personally. Can I leap on that for a second? Hmm. Um, because, like, spoilers, and I'll probably have a long dive track about this later, but, like, I, I didn't get on really well with this album. Um, and I, part of that, I think, is, like, if I, if I, I can listen to, like, individual songs and take them as a... Uh, uh, an art form or album is just an art form. I feel like they're different things. And I'm going to get on to that later with 1975, because I feel like that is an album of, of songs you're meant to take individually. Um, but with mm. this one, like when I hear the opening track, um, Pink Diamond, which I have my own problems with, but when that starts with Charlie going, like, I just want to go real hard. And it's like, it's building me up and building me up. And I, I this was my first Charlie experience because I just don't listen to a lot of pop. Um, so that set me up for like, okay, then do that. And then when it was the album it was, uh, I, I just felt like I'd been set up for failure, if that makes sense. Yeah, that that's it understandable if that's what sense. you expected. Mm. Like, it, it's it's a lot moodier than the first track leads you. Like, Pink Diamond is a track yeah. that I actually like, but in terms of its placement on the album, it's the most, like, I mean, there are parts of things like, like Forever has these parts where it just sort of, like, the, the mm. noise just blares, like, so loud, but it always, like, <laughs> veers back into a conventional song. But, like, mm-hmm. Pink Diamond is just straight up, like, it's abstract, it's weirdly structured, it, like, it is mm-hmm. very much a, a right. weird tone setter for a weird album. I mean, sure. Yeah. But just to, to go, to just go back to Idols for a second, right? Um, that album, Joys and Act of Resistance, starts with Colossus. Great um, track. Which does a similar thing of, like, repetition, building, uh, noise it's the most post-punky upon noise song upon on noise. The album. I know, but it's like noise upon noise upon noise upon repetition upon repetition mm-hmm. upon repetition. And then the album lives up to that mm-hmm. um, in, in a really wonderful way. Uh, yeah, what and, follows makes sense mm, Yeah, for, for the was, opening. And I have my own issues with Pink Diamond that I will get on to. Uh, I, mean, I mean, to be honest, when I critique an album, it's always really deeply personal, whether I like it or don't like it. Yeah. It's like, 
it's not like a movie or a book where I can be very critical and analytical about it. With with music, it's always like this resonated with this thing in my life or personality or philosophy, and I and I and I do or don't like that. Yeah. Um, and if I could mount, sorry, you, you want to keep going? No, no, no. I intend to get onto Pink Diamond once you, and the um general cool. once you will praise the hell out of it, which it deserves. So cool. I just want to like touch on some of the things that you've mentioned and also like the way the album is structured and what it does and doesn't do. I what really resonates to me about how I'm feeling now, I think it's the most immaculately, perfectly structured record she's done by yeah, far. Yeah, that's definitely and true. what I think is so great about the way that it works is this is fundamentally an album about anxiety. It's mm-hmm. not an album about having a good time in any sense. And all of the songs that seem to reflect the desire to have a good time, the experience of having a good time, whether fictional, whether dreamed, imagined, or or, mem- or just a memory, every kind of song that's about that or every kind of song that touches on that is um, mm-hmm. in a very self-aware way, steeped in anxiety and steeped in Absolutely. depression and just total... Um, hatred of the situation that they're mm-hmm. in but also kind of like self-blame for not you know doing more or uh, making more of an effort or being good enough or yeah. whatever it's and a very like, self-critical album like yeah, i have yeah, never you're seen absolutely right yeah like the i've never seen why, a pop album this like harsh on itself the the reason I, why I, I know i didn't get on with it but you are right you are correct objective like <laughs> Uh, there was a song in like the back half of it that's like very, it feels very dancey and um, I was getting absorbed in the music of it and then like I caught a lyric just out of the mess of sounds that was so bleak I was yeah. just like, where did that come from? In a good way, yeah. like I will never say it doesn't have pluses, but yeah, I'm just saying I think the why Pink I, Diamond works yeah. so well, like despite the fact that the rest of the album for the most part doesn't go in that direction is that it kind of is that choice kind of establishes the song as a kind of statement about the situation about how like she she wants to go real hard she wants to party but she's not mm-hmm. able to for the foreseeable future she's not going to be able to so it's kind of like the future kind of is just talking about the futility of that how an intentional like, disappointment yeah mm-hmm. almost like she's kind of like commenting on how pathetic she thinks it is like herself right. Yeah. Like, and I think that it's kind of like once you hear the record and then you get back to that going back on the second time, I think that's when it kind of hits how um, desperate, how kind of, yeah, tragically um, desperate that song is. And it mm. also kind of uh, reappears towards the end of the album because what happens is the album goes on this kind of journey where most of the first half of it is about her relationship with her partner and then her relationship mm-hmm. with her own emotional state. Um, for like three quarters of the album and then at the very end the topic shifts slightly towards her relationships with her friends and her relationships with her own extroversion basically yeah her desire to be expressive and then like on the last two tracks particularly on anthems is kind of yeah. a spiritual successor to pink diamond where she's kind of talking about um oh that song is so great because she's talking about how you know her whole identity is 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 um wrapped up in this kind of partying and this kind of um being with friends and kind of just losing yourself in music and losing yourself in that whole scene but then the lyrics of the songs beside that are all about kind of like converting the dull domesticity of the quarantine existence into a party so she talks about eating cereal and um you know hanging out with her boyfriend at at home Mm -hmm. doing nothing and then it kind of it all kind of yeah you you see it's interesting because now you said it out like that i can totally see how it's like a quarantine album and it's about all those things and i'd love to go back and listen to it through through the eyes you just let me see it through um but i i to be honest like and this might just be because i it takes me a long time to sit with a song until i really focus on the lyrics um but um so maybe that's just something I have to think about in future doing this um, podcast. So just going to the albums earlier before we do the episode and sitting with well, them this, longer. This and that's was fine. like a little rush to be fair. This, we kind of jumped in. No, no, but that's fine. And I'm happy to admit 
that. And I'll probably talk about it on the next episode of like, yeah. well, I went back to this album and now I think that yeah, this Tyler and I have been sitting on the Charlie album longer than anybody else here. That is also quite true. Right. Yeah. But I will say what it took me back to was um, when a uh, bit of personal history here, I lived in Leeds for about six months, um, which is a town in the North of England. It's in Yorkshire. That's quite like a cultural hub. And I, graduated from my school and then went to study English in Leeds and I spent three months there and then dropped out to study film but I spent another three months there trying to get a job and it just didn't work but um it took me right back to there and it took me back to going to Tiger Tiger and I don't know if you guys have heard of Tiger Tiger it's a British no. nightclub chain franchise um Sounds like the worst thing ever. <laughs> it, it, it's awful. And I feel like if the, it, if the lyrics of these songs weren't so morbid a lot of the time, these songs would be played over and over and over at that nightclub. Um, and it's me right back to that. that and the thing is, is it's like with Pink Diamond, it got me off to a bad start. Because I, um, the way Charlie talks in that really blatant, British, like very middle-class British accent. Um, mm -hmm. He does an American accent later on the album in some songs. Um, but I noticed very clearly, like, I just want to go real hard. And I was like, you sound like the sixth former of St. Trinian's. Um, <laughs> and it's like, I, I know this person because I've been to Tiger Tiger with this person. And I don't want to spend any time with this person. So the album, like, yeah. set me up for failure in that way because I'm hearing them go, I just want to go real hard. And I'm just like... The hardest you ever went was when you picked on the kids who read Stephen King at school. <laughs> <laughs> Me? You know, I no, exactly. Like, I would have been bullied by Charlie XCX at school. Like, and this is just it. It maybe it's like the idol thing, where it's like, I know exactly who that is, and I hate them. Um, and that set me up for failure really badly for the rest of the album. Although there, it, it immediately goes to Forever, which is a song I like a lot. Yeah, Forever's um, my favorite song on the album. Amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like my third favourite, I think. There are songs I really like on it, don't get me wrong. I really like Forever, I really like Detonate, I really like I Finally Understand. Um, so if it makes you feel any better, Pink Diamond is probably one of my least favourite songs on the album as well. I think it is my least favourite, actually. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, I agree. Um, but I think that thematically um, it's, it, it's well placed and I, I think that there's like a real tangible sadness to the fact that she says, I, I just want to go real hard, I want to go real hard, there's no arrival there. But it is kind of at the same time, it does feel like a bit of a half baked song. Its um, brevity is its strength. It. It's just, it's over and it gets its job right. done. But it's yeah. not like I don't mind the fact that it's brevity and half done. Like, if the song Colossus had finished before it becomes uh, a punk song, I would have been very happy with that as yeah. like a, an idea because it's, it, 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 it's setting you up. That's the point of an opening track. It's like, it doesn't, it can be, but it doesn't need to be a whole thing. It just needs to be um, a way to bring you into the album. If mm -hmm. if we are approaching the album as the complete artwork, not the songs. Yeah. Um, so I don't mind it being half-baked. It was just like, I felt a lot of dissonance where it's like, I have been to student union nightclubs with people who are like, yeah, like I just did lots of ecstasy and cocaine in the toilets and like, I'm going to go home like, Suck my boyfriend's dick, and he's gonna like choke me out, and it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, it's it's really interesting that you say that, Sersha, because I feel like I can like if I can like speak for the other four of us, I have never done anything remotely like that before in my life, ever. Right. And I yeah. feel like because that experience has not tainted my like perception of that world, my introversion is just very much easily able to latch onto this kind of yeah. thing. Because like yeah. I know for a fact Morgan has also never done anything like that because that is just not who we are as people. We don't right. do that. Yep. And not August is not anymore, like legally but... able to. So you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, another thing I want to add real quick as well that. I think what encapsulates my problems with the structure of Pink Diamond, even though I think it's a good song, I just think it's one of the weaker songs, is yep. that structurally uh, what it reminds me of, and it's not of, and obviously there's another song on the album that reminds, 
will, will remind us all of this song because it um, explicitly references it much more clearly, but it reminds me of the song Click on the Charlie record mm -hmm. in the sense that it's a song about partying that kind of just gets more and more hype and then just kind of falls apart at the end into this kind of swell of noise, basically. Yeah. Both songs yeah. do the same thing, but what Click is, is Click is a much better formed song. Mm -hmm. Click is a song that has a much clearer and more kind of intricate story that it's telling through the different perspectives. It's, it's a narrative, of the, really. Of the Click members, basically. Uh, and, what, and so basically, Pink Diamond is a fine intro to the record. It doesn't have to be a long song. It works as an intro. But it makes me think of Click every time I listen to it, and it makes me wish I was listening to Click. Right, and right. I mean, that's I, another the thing that's so strong sorry. about... Sorry. No, I was just going to say, like, if that reminds you of Click, I got... I've since gone back to this artist and realized that then that I was wrong. But um, the whole time I was listening to the album, I was thinking of MIA a lot. That, um, yeah. Yep. That's a yes. big, big, yeah. big through line influence for her. Yeah. And MIA was a really big artist for me when I was a younger person, um, especially her like biggest song, Paper Planes. Paper, was just, uh, Paper Planes like, from Far Cry 3. That's how I know it. Oh, I just know because it was on like British MTV all the time. That's yeah, the kind of song that would be on British all MTV. The time as well. yeah. I remember hearing it when it yeah. came out. Yeah. yeah, but it's like the thing. I, and I've gone back to that song and I forgot how dark that song is. Yeah. Um, and I know from the documentary that came out about MIA like two years ago. Yes. Yeah. That, um, really she has had a life, you know? And it's like when I hear MIA sing about guns and drugs and poverty i'm like i believe you've authentically lived that mm -hmm. but when i hear the horse girl sing stuff like this to me i'm just like i you know what if that's your truth fine i can't relate that's fair mm -hmm. that's totally yeah. fair like exactly you're right but your perspective um influences that in a big way like yeah um if so to uh get on to my perspective of this <laughs> album, which should be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Um, um, so make in, in a way that makes sense, I'll follow in Saoirse's footsteps and actually completely double down on her thoughts on Pink Diamond and just say that I think it's an absolutely abysmal song. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I think I get what it's going for and I think it fails miserably. Um, I just find it, I just find it vapid and boring and completely overproduced, and in a way that is just not appealing at all to me. I just saw so now, Tyler's soul leave his body. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Well, I just no, like, I have, genuinely, I can see where you're coming from, and I don't disagree completely with. You. I have much more positive thoughts on the rest of the record because so I, I think. I think the rest of it is, again, my problem with the Charlie record that came out last year was just that it was completely overblown and overproduced and that there was just nothing for me to connect with to it. And that problem does persist throughout this album, I think. Although I like this one much more because I can hear where it's coming from much more than I heard it on the last one. Mm. Like, there are ideas that makes sense to me as opposed to the last album that did not make any sense to me and I just didn't care. Um, this album is, there's a lot more of the songwriting that I connect with, like for instance, like Forever that we mentioned, uh, but more specifically, uh, Enemy and Detonate. Those yeah. are just, those Enemy. are two songs that are just very good, I think. But even still, they're not songs I'm going to come back to very often at all just because this production style is just it's way too much i think like i would love to see a charlie xcx record that's like way stripped down but as, oh. as is i just think it's it's just too much there's just listen too to, much listen to true romance i think that might be the charlie xcx record that you're most likely to enjoy that's a great film <laughs> that's true. a great film I, and I'd obviously like to... that record title is cribbed from the film it's, obviously uh, she, she has a lot of weird obtuse references in her music that I latch on to but like Tyler I think I'll speak for you and say that like 
it's weird because Morgan and I's taste in pop music is usually the same because I'm pretty sure it's just because we didn't really like, just because we were more alternative kids, we're just sort of naturally adverse to it. Oh, so we, we just kind of like, like, like the, fir- the first pop album that was just like unapologetically a pop album, 100% through and through that I fell in love with from beginning to end was um, Emotion. Yeah, which say, is say is a song is an album that is full of songs that are clearly structured that are have that have production that is like perfectly catered to um like the sensibilities of people who want to enjoy pop music but also like like other kinds of music and charlie what she does with her production is it's so overproduced that it lends itself to have a like a specific texture to the point where it's like it's blown out it's 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 like mm-hmm. it's it's it, it just sounds the specific way it's it's like again like there are moments on this album where i was thinking of like jenny death era <laughs> death grips where it's just yeah. like what the fuck so yeah, and I, like I fucking hate yeah. Death Grips. So. Yeah, and uh, so I mean, I, 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 I will say that's one thing I really liked about the album was that, um, I mean, to be honest, I felt like the whole, it fell between two stalls for me a bit in where it's like, I love the poppy shit and I loved the experimental stuff, but I felt like it sort of fell, it fell oh, between, beast. I felt like it fell between two stalls a bit for me in those mm-hmm. respects when looking to them individually. It was only when it became like dance music at, towards <sighs> the end. Well, mm-hmm. But that's just like a sound I'm allergic to. Um, yeah. I think there is something about the, uh, there is definitely qualities of the aesthetic that this album embraces that y- you very much uh, are kind of really can get on board with or you can't get on board with. Like it goes back mm-hmm. the last few years and I think it's not that the important thing to realize is that with the last few years with Charlie's music and it's gotten stronger, the more she's kind of become convinced of this is that she's not even mm-hmm. trying to be commercially successful with the music no. anymore. It's not trying to be commercial pop music anymore. Um, it's just, there's a, the, she's fully embraced the kind of aesthetic of this yeah. post bubblegum bass era. PC music. Bulk, the bulk of the record. See, I don't even think this is a PC music record. I think that it's kind of. We've no, it's an evolution of that. It. What's happened is that in the last year, because the bulk of this record was produced by Dylan Brady, who is the 100 Gex guy, basically. Oh, um, wow. That makes a lot of sense. The thing is, um, I, you're probably thinking, oh, Tyler obviously absolutely loves 100 Gex. It's so his thing. And I actually had a, quite a few issues with that record because while I do like the aesthetic yeah, style, uh, yeah, me too. my problem with that record was that there weren't enough songs on it. Yeah, and they were too short. Like, I, like yeah. I loved what was there. It's just that there was never enough of it for me to latch on to. There I, were I great, felt the some exact great same songs way. on it. There were some great songs on it, but they just weren't enough. It didn't feel yeah, like an album. It was not it substantive like, enough for me. No. Yeah, and I'm sure that their next record will be um, better. But yeah. what it felt like, what how I'm feeling now was for me was um, the realization of that sound and that aesthetic. Into Giving it a skeleton. Project. Yeah, into, the, into a cohesive project, project where every song was fully thought through. There's no interludes on here. There's no afterthought tracks on here. There's no let's throw something weird in for the sake of it on here. The yeah. most structural... Uh, 1975! No <laughs> Swedish we producers. Will, we will get the most you. <laughs> the most structurally bizarre... 100% pure uncut, uncut box. <laughs> The most structurally bizarre or unusual um, or uniquely formed song on how I'm feeling now is C 2.0. And that's yeah. very purposefully a sequel to collect from the previous record that's, that is basically built on a sample of that song. Mm-hmm. And for the first minute and a half of that, it's just basically a remix. And then it kind of evolves into quite beautifully, I think, into um, a spiritual sequel to that song that feels necessary not just it doesn't just feel like a, del- a callback for the fans but feels integral to the narrative of the yeah. record she wanted that, to do something previous, with it yeah in that previous record the song was about enjoying partying and being able to party and this song is kind of like a lament for that time where the uh, and she's talking about how i miss them so much i miss them so much and it's really one of that, the most emotional parts that, of the that's album. a perfect metaphor for it in a way that like charlie is getting drunk and getting high at a party and how i'm feeling now is the hangover yeah, and she's just doing it on her own now, and she's 
you know, she's completely unable to do that thing. And I mean, if you dislike that kind of person that that reminds you of, that's totally fair. Like, yeah. obviously, that's your experience, and that that is it's not fair to say that that's an. Thank invalid, God, I don't have that experience. It's not fair to say that's Oops. an invalid reason for disliking the record. But I yeah. think if you get onto her wavelength for where she's coming from, the fact that the way that she lives her life, her extroversion is such is such an important part of her character to her is like so much of who she is. And once that's taken away, her ability to express that is taken away. All she's left with, all she's able to perceive are her own weaknesses, her own vulnerabilities, her own lack of any other substantive aspects of her life. Yeah. Then the record becomes this kind of horrifying confrontation with the hollowness of your own existence, basically. Could, could I just say something very quickly? Mm. Yeah. Um, I have always thought that, um, there's a thing that Roger Ebert said about movies that I say a lot, which is, um, he says that they're empathy machines. I that. And I think, <laughs> thank you. I think that's 100% true, but not just about movies, but about art in general, art. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, it's about showing you perspective. And I think that if I had this, like, viscerally unpleasant reaction to this album, in the... In a way, it just reminded me of a part of my life that just isn't a part of my life anymore. Mm. Um, and it put me in the head of a character uh, that I know and don't get on with. I think almost like if that's the reaction I have, then I need to reapproach my reaction because if it is an empathy machine, I should leave myself open to that experience mm-hmm. in, in a way I haven't. Um, and again, with something like C two point out again, this is my first experience of Charlie. So that is also what, very like that. That's probably also a contributing factor here is that I would not pick this yeah. as a place to start with her. Yeah. So with C two point when I listened to that the first time around, I was like, this feels like a loose collection of ideas thrown together. Mm-hmm. But when you say it like that, I'm like, if I was listening to it with those ears, I would think it was beautiful. That's a good way to put that. I think uh, that's, it's. Mm. I think it's impressive at all that I was able to enjoy any part of this record. Yeah, I expected you to hate it. Yeah, I'm, Cons- I'm considering so considering how far removed the person writing it is from me as a person, mm-hmm. like we c- from just judging by this record alone, we could not be more different people. <laughs> yeah. So so considering that I was able to enjoy some of the songwriting on here. I think that's a testament to like just I think that's a testament to the appeal of the album overall. Mm-hmm. That said, I feel like I was fighting to get a hold on it the whole time. I feel that most of it was just in one ear and out the other. Your experience with how I'm feeling mm-hmm. now is my experience with Charlie, like down to a T. Like everything, oh. about, like vaguely positive, but fighting to like to 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 get a hold into it truly. Whereas yeah, no, my, for me with Charlie, that record, I, when that came out, I had been a fan of uh, Charlie for over a year, I think probably closer to two years. And um, so it felt like this was um, something that I'd been wanting from her in the sense that it was a more kind of holistic reflection of who she was, a realisation of um, her personality being, um, being uh, made into proper music and um, while I definitely understand the complaints that people have with that record and the way that it's structured I do like the way that that consistently with everything that she's done she's kind of opened herself up more and more and developed more and more kind of mature ways in terms of the songwriting and in terms of the um, structure of her records of expressing who she is and how she's feeling yeah Um, Mm -hmm. yeah you know my, my thoughts on the last album are much more akin to my thoughts on Pink Diamond. Mm. Though, <laughs> to an admittedly lesser extent, I think I think Pink Diamond is, is a fair bit worse than anything on that last album. Just because, almost solely because of how it plays into this album structurally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. August, what do you think of the Charlie record? Oh yeah, I haven't said like anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I know, I've been itching for your perspective. I want to know what your thoughts are. So on my first two listens, I thought, wow, this is the worst record I've ever heard. This is the worst (laughs) album of the decade. But 
And this is like worse than, worse than Eminem's revival. It, it well, <laughs> I it, right. it just it just felt so vapid and pointless. But then I guess I I waited a day to listen to it again, and then I I kind of listened to it, and I just had this experience of like, well, I think that the, the the kind of vapidity of it i realized i realized that was kind of the point that mm-hmm. like that just suddenly clicked with me as like kind of a shower thoughts moment yeah <laughs> yeah and it's, August just and like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> what don't worry okay. about it okay buddy it was funny. That's, that's all. Over. That's all. I, I was literally in the shower. Okay. It's yeah, true. I mean, I was I was reenacting. No, what I imagined that <laughs> oh, moment okay. looking like. No, Probably. sorry, I can't hear anything half of the time. So, not not sorry. That's just a weird diatribe. But anyways, it's really my pers- interesting. It's really interesting, August, that you say that like the the vapidity of it is kind of like uh, the point or like what in. What did you, I actually can't remember exactly what your words were. That is what but, he said. Yeah, that's what yeah. he said. But it's interesting to me that you say that because I think this and her last record, but especially this, are her like most direct, least vapid, least ironic, least um, commentary offering mm. music yet. Yeah, like it's almost like this is just the dire. anti-pop too. Honestly. Yeah, exactly. This is just like she's. You could the lyrics at times read like they're not even constructed into songs. They're just taken from a diary. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. And I think the music reflects that as well. Um, but I, I mean, that's just interesting, mm. I thought. No, yeah. Uh, oh, that, that said, I can't imagine how August and I would feel about the earlier record. No, that's the thing. If, <laughs> yeah, like, thing is, I think... Thing is, <laughs> exactly. Thing is, with the first two Charlie Records, True Romance and Sucker, the reason why I think you might enjoy those, maybe not Sucker as much, but certainly True Romance, is because the production style is much different. It's much, they're much cleaner yeah. records. They're much more pop commercial sounding records suckers a banger emotions are, emotions a terrible comparison but they are closer to that than anything yeah, they she's are. done since her mixtapes so i think you would enjoy that aspect of the music mm. um it's very early 2000s indie pop stuff but no i don't think the production is is really what i have an issue with because it it kind of grew on me mm. as like just yeah this this is what this album is going for so i was definitely fine with it like initially it did annoy me to no end but as it as it went as it kind of went on i was like yeah i i get this now but for me where this album falters i know we've had our pink diamond diatribe i like it as an opener doesn't really tie in with everything else uh but for me first like five songs from pink diamond to like detonate i love all of those a good yeah. deal but then when it gets to one. enemy it just starts to kind of crumble for me as an album just because like enemy is just it, it feels like it's such a stupid song like at, at that point, I have to question even the mere concept of what's going on. Maybe you're going to say the concept of music. <laughs> well, it's interesting to me that that's the point where the record falters for you because it's in the middle of a very specific stretch of songs that are dealing with the same topic. Yes, so yeah, seven, no, exactly. From seven years to I finally understand, those songs are all about her relationship with her partner. Yes, um, exactly. And I think there's a nice arc to them. So it's interesting no, it's, that that's where the record falls for you. And, and, no, that's, I agree with you. It's strange because I don't quite get why that's where it falters for me. But I, I guess it's just, at that point, the kind of individual premises of the songs start to get a bit too goofy for me and it gets a bit too overblown. Like, the, the whole idea of like, maybe you're my enemy because we're so close and yet so far away in terms of distance. <laughs> well, the thing is, all this is that they're not far away in terms of distance because they're quarantined together in the same space. And her, her, her concern is because this is the first time that they've been living together in an extended, for an extended period of time, that 
there will become there will be aspects of her personality that, or the, the way that she is that he'll discover um, that will turn him against her. Um, that's basically what the song's about. Well, I, th- I think it's I think it's implicative of the quality of the song. Well, not maybe the quality, just how me and August feel about it. That we've both listened to it multiple times now, and it took you having to explain that to us. Yeah, for no. us to latch onto the idea. Yeah. At no, all. that's that. It, personally, I would agree entirely. Personally, I think "Enemy" is probably the best hook on the album for me. I I don't care about the lyrics whatsoever. I just think the the hook is pretty good. Yeah, it's got it settles good. into a great groove. No, yeah, I would is, agree with that concept of like you having to explain that to finally get it is is kind of just indicative of the piece as a whole. August, if I may uh, yeah, make a proposition, may... would the, this stretch specifically where it begins to fall apart for you, is it perhaps because it's the songs where she's talking about her partner, because that's where the songwriting sounds the most homogenous and, like, generic? Because, like, she's, you know, singing about your partner in pop music is, like, you know, that's, that, that's, that's like the first thing that comes to mind. So when you get to the hooks of that, and when you get to the lyrical content, if you don't like really, if like, if you're like, you're not like me and Tyler and you're like actively looking for something in there to like really get to the heart of what she's saying, and you're sort of like listening to it, like as, you know, the collage of sound that it truly is, it can just kind of sound like a, you know, a, a pop song with weird production. Like mm-hmm. perhaps maybe that is why. I mean, I think you're definitely onto something with with that idea mm-hmm. of like it it could very well be that and and I'm just trying to read through my notes to see if I can find anything that's like a good indication of I think as well that um she handles the topic of her relationship so fantastically well on the songs detonate an enemy yeah, that the song seven years and i finally understand just by comparison don't work as well for me they're probably my two least favorites on the record um just because i don't especially connect with them as songs or they just feel like expressions of ideas that are better expressed elsewhere just like pink diamond is uh, an expression of an idea that's better expressed on anthems mm-hmm. for me. Can I, yeah can I just, I if we're talking about songs that don't resonate with us like I completely concur with what Morgan and August said about, like, it took Tyler explaining something about the songs to get them. Yeah. Um, But there's a song called Claws on the album Mm -hmm. Mm. where there's a hook where she repeats the same line twice. And the second line, second time she repeats it, it just does not fit the pentameter or cadence of the rhythm. And I just felt like it sounded really awkward. And that's like the third song on the album. Uh, See, I, and I, just, I just hated it. I'm just genuinely struggling to remember what that song sounds like. No, I am too. Even though I, even though I have it listed as like a song I liked, I can't. See, I remember it just yeah, because I, I think that too. was a single, wasn't it? No, yeah. It was the second single. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It was the second single. That's why I remember it. Yeah. And I like that song. I, I love that song too. It's very much like, maybe more than anything else on the record, it's very much the most kind of like 2017 era Charlie yep. song. Like, like it's very, right. like it's short, it's noisy, it's, um, mm-hmm. it ends incredibly abruptly um, and just kind of just is there. Like it's very much like a for the fans sort of sounding song. Mm-hmm. Uh, and mm-hmm. it doesn't necessarily have a lot to contribute to the narrative of the record either. Uh, it's especially strange coming after forever, I think. Although, in a sense, I don't know. That's an, I'll finish that thought and get back to you later. But, um, but yeah, it is a very kind of like, if Charlie's sound is something you're not into, it's a song that you're probably going to struggle with just because it's just, mm-hmm. it ends so abruptly. It's very kind of like... First listen, it wasn't my thing, but as I like, I, I grew accustomed to the album, and I, I feel like I grew to like it a lot more with uh, repeated listen. It's almost probably the. Mo- it's also probably the, the moment on the record where the lyrics are the most, um, meaningless. Yeah. In terms of like mm-hmm. contributing towards the record, they're just there to, add to the sound of the song. Basically, I almost mm. feel like the fact that this like, this album is such a raw portrait of vulnerability that I feel like 
in like the way that it's structured it's so dependent on how you engage with it that it can either appear as a jagged mess or a completely cohesive experience that you understand from beginning to end. I feel like it's yeah. just so, it's multifaceted in a lot of ways. And so if it clicks for you, it just sort of like, it'll all lock into place. It's like a Rubik's cube. And right. you know, you can just like keep turning it and you can get there. And then, you know, if you don't, it's just kind of a mess of colors. So, mm. hmm. Perhaps That's it fair. is. I like that description. Uh, yeah. Can I, can I just ask a favor? Hmm. Um, before we talk about 1975, can we just like take half an hour because my phone's about to die? I want to let it charge up a bit more. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Right, well, yeah, so we can. We can just the magic of, here. Through the magic of editing, there will yes, be a but seamless. What we should do a seamless is, transition. What we should do uh, is for um, just the Charlie album. Uh, what we each of us individually would give the album out of ten. <laughs> yeah. And then we will skip to the next section. All right, yeah. and uh, okay. Tyler, why don't you go first? Uh, I would give it a uh, a very light, but still giving it this number, a light nine out of ten. Okay, okay. Um, personally, I would give it a uh, like a if I'm gonna Fantano this a uh, a light to decent eight. Uh, I really enjoy it. It's my favorite uh, of, of hers so far. It's uh, in the upper echelons of my more preferred albums this year, and I'll uh, I'll definitely come back to it. I'll come back to it a lot. Morgan? Uh, for me, it's like a very strong 5 out of 10. Mm -hmm. There's just... There's, there's so much that while I'm listening to it, I'm like, okay, I see the concept here, and I can appreciate it. But like, mm -hmm. I wrote down Claws as one of my more preferred tracks, and I could not hum a melody from it mm -hmm. right now to save my life. I have, <laughs> I have no idea what it sounds like. It just, it's just, it's just nothing about the record is going to stick with me, even if yeah. I can appreciate it from afar. Gotcha. All right. Sersha? Mm. Or August? Either no, one. Sersha, go first. Okay. I'm going to give it a three. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Woo! Just Aya. was not for me. I appreciate I your honesty. It. I respect it, but it ain't me. That's the review. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, I I had this listed on, like, just my notes as, like, a, uh, like, a light seven, but now that I'm realizing I can't remember a thing about what I even liked, I'm feeling more <laughs> like, feeling more like a decent five, honestly. What a drop. Oh, wow. Whew. So, I, I cannot, it's just... It's there, but like, I just can't tell you a thing about it. <sighs> what was That's your rating okay. again, Jake? Hmm? What was your rating again? Eight. Okay, so doing maths in my head very quickly. Um, Quick so 31 divided by five. It's just over a six on average. Yeah, it's a six out of ten on average from us. I think uh, what someone said earlier uh, that we can next week we can kind of briefly talk about whether the records have changed in our estimation might be a cool thing to do each week. That is um, that is a great idea, Tyler. I, just I, like, I for like for a, lot. a couple minutes just to talk about whether even if you haven't yeah. listened to the record since, which I wouldn't blame you for not doing yeah. considering we probably had to consume it apes to prepare for this. Yes. Um, sometimes just sitting with something for a while can can um, have an effect. Mm -hmm. I like that Absolutely. idea a lot. All right, so okay. Tyler. I'm, yeah, down. I'm going to leave the call now to give myself a chance to recharge. Yeah. Right. Okay, Let's we start. are back with the second half where we are going to talk about our second record of the day, and that is going to be Notes on a Conditional Form by the 1975. And because Sersha is struggling with battery life, we are going to let Hello. her have the floor first, and uh, and then we will discuss afterwards. So, yes. Notes on a Conditional Thank you. Form. Thank you. No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> My experience with 1975 is that um, when I was, uh, oh, I think I was, ex I was expelled from school when that album came out. So it would have been 16, I think, uh, like six years ago. 
um, when the first album came out, and I I loved it to bits. But what I really loved was one of their EPs. And I can't remember which one it is, but it had this B side. It was called You, um, and I thought it was just this fucking beautiful song. And I still think it's beautiful. And I had this one friend from the school I'd gotten expelled from who loved music. He's since gotten a degree degree from Cambridge in music. Um, And he's amazing. He nearly scored a film I made called Dream, but it didn't work out. Um, I edited that. Yeah, Jake edited that. So did I. We both edited it, but Jake did a great job. Um... (laughs) And we went to the 1975 together at the, um, I think it was the Brixton Academy or, yeah, it was the Brixton Academy. I remember the stage. Um, or was it Shepherd's Bush? Either way, famous London arena. Um, and they did their set and they clearly didn't expect an encore, um, but they got one. Um, and so they came out and they did You from that EP. And me and my friend both loved it. And we... Night! Could you cut that out? (laughs) And we both loved it. And we felt like they were playing that song just for us in that room. Um, And I still love that first album so much. Um, And it feels like something that really spoke to... Being young and sort of middle class English at that time in my life, in in a way that the Charlie thing felt like a version of middle class posh British people that I just don't get on with. This was just like it spoke to where I was in that culture. Um, and then the lead single for the second album came out, and I was like, okay, he's trying to be Alex Turner now, and his head is going completely up his back end. Uh, and it wasn't for me. And I was like, it's like the music I love from the first album, but more pretentious. Um, and oh, I you just didn't... poor, poor, poor baby. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, like, I remember people complaining about the... I like it when you sleep being way too self-indulgent. I was like, oh, you got a big... <laughs> you got a stone coming. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oof. It's so sad. It's so sad. And then, yeah, so I didn't listen to anything until I got this assignment to listen to this album because I just, I was going through an edgy phase where I just wasn't listening to anything I liked when I was 16. Um, and it starts with Greta Thunberg, which took me by surprise. <laughs> and then it launches into like a mid 2000s, like at the hives kind of thing. At, and it's like what I was saying about Pink Diamond on the last one. It just sets me up for an album that it isn't. No. Um, I would have much preferred... And the thing is about the 1975 is they used to be a punk band um, before they were the 1975. Um, uh, I've heard a cover they did in that era of Sugar We're Going Down by Fall Out Boy that kicks all of the ass ever. And Matt Healy is doing like screamo vocals. It's crazy. Um, and they only changed the sound when they changed um, keyboardist. Um, so there is a precedent, Your Honor, for this sound. And when I heard that as like a single they were promoting the album with, I was like, okay, I get what they're doing, and I understand why, and I know where it's coming from. And like, it sounds like the blandest of Nortis alternative rock, but it's a direction I am happy to hear them go down, and I want the album to have a bit more of that because it's like, that's like populist music in a way they haven't done since their first album. Um, and I think that's kind of emblematic of the whole album is that it, every song is like something that I didn't expect them to do, but it's like the blandest version possible of that sound. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I have, that's unfair. I have open. Um, I overall, and middling on the album, um, but I have opened on my laptop the one out, the one star review we got from the Independent, and there are two quotes I want to read to you from it. Um, the first one is: "To his fans, the 1975 frontman is a shamanic figure who stands apart from artists afraid to speak their mind. 
To others, he's a preening pseudo-intellectual speaking from a soapbox carved out of privilege and narcissism. And um, the second one is that Matt Healy had said he wrote the album from a zero fucks given perspective. And the quote from the album is, perhaps if they cared a little more perhaps if they'd cared a little more the result wouldn't have been such a smug farrago in which each track grates against the next like the next like rusted gears and even though i kind of like the album overall both of those things are so emblematic of its problems yeah oh yeah mm. and yeah completely irrespective of the album at hand uh matt healy sucks yeah, Matt, Matt Healy is proving himself to be this generation's Morrissey through and through. Yep. Oh my gosh, that's... that's so funny because that's that's exactly what I was going to say later, that this has big, oh Morrissey, look at me big dingus energy. <laughs> I think that, um... That's I think so that much Matt more, is... that's so much better than anything I could say about this. <laughs> <laughs> Morrissey, undeniably... look at my big dingus. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. I think that Matt Healy is undeniably, just undeniably had narcissistic tendencies. He certainly has an overblown ego. I don't know that I think the Morrissey comparison is quite fair because I do think that he comes from a good place and he's well-meaning in the things that he tries to do. He, um, like the blunder he made on Twitter yesterday was very kind of textbook met here. Have you heard him talk about Islam by chance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He does have that, the Islam stuff I can't really defend. But I do think that he comes from a good place. He just comes from a place where he feels the need to um, be seen as important. And it just kind of inflates the attitude with which he sees everything. But I do think he means well. And that um, does make a bit of a difference for me. Um, I don't know that I could enjoy, I mean, I enjoy a lot of the most overblown aspects of this band simply because um, I enjoy the novelty of that. I enjoy the just zaniness of of aspects of that. They're the most boring for me when they're trying to write like acoustic songs or just trying to be really like straightforward. I think that um, sometimes that works. Um, Sometimes it just, I just, it just, become so bland and dull to me that I just can't vibe with it mm-hmm. at all. I enjoy the band when they're trying to be ridiculous, even when it fails, it at least fails in an interesting way. And I think the issue with with Notes is that it does fail um, a few times and it, it's never in interesting ways. It's just always, yes. um, the failure is just a product of the bloat. The good stuff that's here, I think is really, really good. Um, I like People a lot. I think People is one of the best songs they've done because it is um, fully letting loose. And it's and what it is, is it's an attempt. They often like um, do these kind of attempts at different genres. And I wasn't aware of their kind of punk roots. So that adds a little bit extra to the, to the um, story for me. But I like they're at their best when they're putting on this uniform of a different genre and they're just giving it their all they're really fully investing themselves into trying to make it work and and or, and to trying to try to express that genre authentically through their own lens and i think they do it really really well on people even if i think some of the lyrics are cringy and just really <laughs> really kind of like quickly written in a way that doesn't kind of yeah. do them any favors um absolutely it feels the, like a song they wrote after hearing the Greta Thunberg quote and they were just like, we have to write yeah. a song for this. Well, this is the thing. They obviously had the idea for the, the Greta Thunberg intro before they wrote People because um, the People is the only way you could follow a song like that up. Like Absolutely. Pe- like, it's really the only way you follow a song like oh. that. And the issue with the it's album... Almost like is a, the- it's almost like a move that Muse would make, you know? Yeah, 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 for sure. And I think that there probably are, there are even elements you could say of Muse in the sound of that song. And I don't like Muse at all, really, with the exception of some of their earlier records. Um, but I like the song. And imagine my disappointment when they don't try <laughs> anything like it for the rest of the album. And the thing I is, agree like, I agree so li- much. I like a lot of what they try to do on the album. I really like the. Um, the burial influenced UK garage sound that they go for. Mm-hmm. It was really, really good on uh, the song How to Draw Petrichor from the last album. And um, I really liked that little wee taste of it on that track. 
I thought that was a really good track, one of my favorites on that album, which I have otherwise very mixed opinions of. Um, but then like the song Having No Head on this record is the exact same song. Yeah. It's just the same song. It's nothing different. It's the same song. Yeah. It's six minutes. It's the longest track on the yeah. record. Yeah, I think it is. And it's just the same as How to Draw Petra Core. And it's fine because it, they do it well. It's competent. It's, um, it's well produced. It sounds good, but it's the same song. And the issue with the record is the only issue I have with the record is that um, the only issue they do that they do that too often. <laughs> they do that too often. They just record the same song more than once. And the thing Absolutely. is, the reason why they're doing this, like this is Maddie Healy has said that this is the an end of era album. This album is supposed to encapsulate the journey that they've made so far on their first four records, and they're taking a break from making music now. When they come back, they're going to try to completely shift their approach with their music. So this is supposed to be a summary statement, uh, a period yeah. on this kind of um, period of their, it was really poorly constructed sentence, but like, you know, wrapping a bow on the era, basically. And the reason why it has to be 22 tracks is clearly because their longest record, their second record is 17 tracks. And you can totally see how through their warped mindset, you could see that Maddie Healy thinking, there's no way I can wrap up this era. There's no way I can tie this all together, uh, summarize this without doing something bigger than I've done before. Yeah. It has to be bigger. It has to be longer. Yep. And this album goes up to tracks. 11. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why don't you just exactly. make 10 louder? Just make 10 <laughs> louder, Matt Healy. Exactly. But, but this goes like, up to 11. <laughs> I think this could have been their best record if, at 22 tracks, if, the adventurousness of the first half had continued throughout the second half basically um i like the first half of the record a lot i like the first i think the yep. first five tracks on the second half yep. from, i think there's yep. something you should know through to um if you're too shy i think that's a great sequence as well and then the rest of the record from there on is just silence like it's just nothing it's just a shrug mm -hmm. and then the last song is pretty good too um mm -hmm. so i just think that there's a lot of really cool continuation of their experimentation on this record but it just doesn't it lacks the urgency of their previous records and it's just too bloated for its own good absolutely um, it's like i do think though i have some conflicting feelings though because at the same time i also think that in spite of the bloat it's the most well constructed album like mm -hmm. it has two halves that clearly mirror each other 11 track halves that have a clear beginning to end arc and it's like their other records, like especially their last record, were just like ideas, ideas thrown at you with no connective tissue, um, no real semblance of any kind of structure. Whereas this at least tries to have an arc, but it's just infuriating because in spite of that, there's just nothing going on with some of the songs. And that's what really gets me about the record is that I've really connected to the fact and enjoyed the fact that it takes you on a specific journey structurally but then I'm just infuriated by the fact that every time I come back to it, there's just less substance there than there's been before. And it, so I'm in a weird place where I like a lot of elements of the album, but it's also infuriating as well for a lot mm. of the same reasons that I like it. I just, yeah. I love the way you think about music so much. I do too. That's, that's such an Maybe. admirable thing. Like I, I love the way you approach that because even though you are clearly the most positive on this album yes. as anybody here, I think like you, you come to it with like this level of context and I feel like this is going to be somewhat jarring because like as well put as everything you just said was, you I are think, wrong bottom text. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have like, I don't think I have ever like been like everything you just said. I feel exactly the opposite. Wow. And I want to hear from you. <laughs> Okay, so for, for, for a brief context, I have listened to the 1975 for a very long time, actually, like since the beginning of like my music inception from when I met Morgan my senior year of high school, because he recommended their second album, first album to me. And I really liked a lot of the songs on the second album that were like the poppy, hooky ones, and like even some of the like the, the more like emotional songs, like they got to me. The instrumental tracks I just never really vibed with just because that's never really been my like, it's really been more of a recent thing where I've started to enjoy like more instrumental based stuff. Like in the past, 
year, I think I've gotten into that more. And even then, I still go back to that album and that stuff. I'm just, it, it just doesn't vibe with me very well. It's like, I'll, I'll get to that later though, because it's an issue on this album that I have. And then the third one came out and then like, there were so many wildly varying reactions to it that like, I just didn't even really bother. And then when I finally did get around to it, when Morgan told me there were a couple good songs on it, I was like, yeah, I agree with them. There's a couple good songs on here, but I don't remember half of this. So like the, the, ha the, the half that I don't remember being like a, a complete blackout, which I have, like, I, I, you could tell me half of it was a noise rock album and I believe you, I don't, I don't know what was on it. And wow. then I get to this, which the only thing I know about it is I heard the, I think I heard people, was people a single? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I, heard, I, heard, I, I heard people when it dropped and I just didn't know what to make of it then. I was just like, I don't really know if I like this. I don't think I do, but I didn't really give it enough thought to like yeah, no, concretely I, I, think that. I remember I sent it to you mm. when it came out with basically just the reaction of what is this? Honey? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was, that was I, how I, I felt. I, I, yeah, I suppose because I knew they had like a, a more hard edged, well, not hard edged, it was like pop punk, but like, because mm -hmm. I knew they had a history with distort distorted guitars. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't so surprised. Um, I knew that was something Matt Healy was capable of. Um, yeah. It, I think I, what, what, it, it didn't even sorry. really, no, it's okay. I'd go ahead. I was just going to say, I think, again, what I really like about that track is that it, it's so, like, convicted. Like, it's so, like, sincere in its convictions to the point Absolutely. of being almost embarrassing. Like, it's, yes, 100%. Um, even, though, even, could... though it's like, even though it's, like, everything that 1975 haters, like, dislike about the band, it's at least, like, a full embrace of that. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, it's like they're yeah. really, like, those, they're playing the guitars like they really, really mean it. And Maddie Healy is screaming as long as that, like he really, really means it. And Absolutely, that that is that is very true. It is there. There is a sincerity yeah. there, and I I will not deny that for a second. That is one thing that I won't disagree Absolutely. with. Absolutely. If on. I could, if I could just say something here, right? Go for it. And it's about the sincerity because it's like um, it's, uh, I I I was listening to the opening of this album, knowing that it would get mocked for the Greta Thunberg thing because my internal brain was mocking it where it's like, you are hand-holding me and this is didactic and you're literally sitting me down and have someone explain something to me and I'm not okay with it. And you've put twinkly piano in the background. But it was, I was walking my dog and it was a really fucking hot day. Um, this is probably going to end up being the hottest summer uh, for a long time maybe ever um and i was and and the thing is like there is a thing in me where it's like i can be cynical and jaded and hate sincerity but then there's the other side of me that loves paddington too um and something about those first two tracks flipped the switch in me when it was on the other side at the beginning and i can't quite put my finger on it but i was just like they're like now, Greta Thunberg does have a point, and Matt Healy is kind of using his privileged platform to platform someone whose voice needs to be heard. So, you know, mm -hmm. I I am going to stop having a problem with this, and I enjoy the album yeah. a lot more as a result. I think I I, I think, like that know, perspective a, a lot, and I I appreciate that. And that being said, I didn't really get to my point because I was establishing context. I oh sorry. No, I, I, I'm just making it clear to everyone to to clear the air here so that we don't have any, like, misgivings. I hate this album. <laughs> like, oh, wow. I didn't, I didn't what? think that I, like, hated it. But the more it sat with me, and once I got to, like, my fourth listen of the album, I was just like, okay, here's, I, I, I have to, like, take notes and, and, and explain this. And let me let me just get get this out of the way. Is that like, I, you know, I agree with everything that Matt and and Greta by extension is saying in that first track. And I feel like I'm beating a dead horse and and taking down an easy target with this. That being said, I find the first track almost to be offensive because I feel like 
I am being wow. not talked at by, like, I feel like I am being not talked down to, but I am being lectured by someone who is also wow. a child. I feel <laughs> like, like, and it's not because it's Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg has a lot of great points. She's a very smart girl. That being said, this, th this obsession that Matt Healy has with trying to capture the moment to, 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 to be this, this vague idea of postmodernism, it is like, it is so vague and so nonsensical that I feel like this just, this message just happens on the album and then I don't feel like, I don't understand why it's there. I don't like the, 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 the rest of the record, like the, the song immediately after, is the only thing that is even tangentially related to that. And it's like this sweeping statement with this dramatic piano in the background and it's like trying to make this point. And I'm like, okay, I'm I, like, it is, it is just so, it's, it's, it's neoliberal posturing and I am, I, I am sick to death of it. I spend all day on Twitter and I know that's my fault, but I see it every single day. And that is all yeah, this album yeah, reeks yeah, up yeah. to me. Just, it is, it is, it is shouting. It is entitled. It is, it, it just makes me angry. And that being said, when we actually go into people, people pisses me the fuck off because people is an unapologetically sincere song, which the Greta Thunberg thing beforehand reeks to me of something that is trying to be sincere, but rings is completely hollow. I, I don't right, like th right. this. This feels like window dressing. This feels like a thing that he tossed in here to be relevant, to, to, to be the moment. And then it is immediately juxtaposed by something that he is actually passionate about. And yet it is still the most thuddingly obvious, thuddingly simple, repetitive, like bullshit. And it's just all of this intensity that I really appreciate that is in service of absolutely nothing. And that is how I feel wow. about oh, wow. the entire experience. It is just a whole lot of things that add up to be almost the negative sum of their parts. And it becomes infuriating to listen to for 80 minutes multiple times. It is just like every yeah. bit of goodwill the album builds up with me is gradually degraded. And the thing yep. is, Tyler, the, the thing about it is that you were saying that you love them when they were indulgent and experimental and all of that. And to be perfectly honest with you, that's when I hate them the most. And when they try to be boring and conventional and just make a normal song, I'm like, oh, thank God, you're throwing me a life raft. I can, I can latch on to something. There's a song structure here. There's a, there's a hook. There's a, like a lyric that I'll, like, I'll just be like, oh, that's a good thing. And like a great example is Jesus Christ 2005, God Bless America, which- Really I, good song. I, I the title, I, I'm gonna, no, not gonna do it. But the thing is, <laughs> is that like, I like, I like the track aesthetically, mainly because Phoebe Bridgers sings half of it. And I yep. like Phoebe Bridgers. And I don't yep. super care for Matt's lyrics, but like on, on the surface, that song just like, it, it, it works. I can listen to it and I won't get angry. And that's also yeah, okay. songs like Nothing Revealed, Everything Denied, uh, Then Because She Goes, mm -hmm. Playing On My Mind. These yeah. are all songs that have definitive structures. These are all songs that I- Really good like songs. I can, yeah, they, yeah. They, they, they are fully formed and they have an idea in them or birthday party where it's just like you get, you get across a theme. There's a story, there's a yeah. narrative, there's an arc. And then the rest of it is just like, oh, here's a bunch of like, here's five tracks that are all a minute and a half long and they're all bullshit. And it's just like, Matt, if I wanted to listen to burial oh. i'd listen to fucking burial this is not burial shut up yeah, yeah. stop it <laughs> it's infuriating. i, 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 I love mean. that I, I just want to say i love that i agree with both tyler and Jake <laughs> at the same time yeah, this is this is amazing because i just felt like the most thorough <laughs> feeling of solidarity from that entire oh. rant that i've never no, heard. i did too and, you know, and then i still think the album's all right yeah i'm, glad. I'm, I'm <laughs> really glad when I say that I like them when they're indulgent and stuff, I don't, I don't mean that I exclusively like that. I would say that Jesus Christ and The Birthday Party are two of my top five songs on the record. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're great because they're stripped down. They're great because they're properly written. They're great because they have a good progression and they're very easy to listen to. And yet they don't feel like a compromise on the band's um, thematic vision no. or like what Matty Healy is generally going for. Uh, I just... Um, I just wish that 
because uh, so I think the first half of the record, for the most part, with maybe one or two exceptions, is really great. And like they mostly succeed for me with just about everything they try. And like where it falls flat is that they just stop trying it eventually. At a certain point, they just stop trying. And yeah. they just start phoning yeah. it in. And that's where it lets me down. Like I could deal with a record full of songs like Jesus Christ or even a song that I don't like that much, like um, What Should I Say? Or some of, those, some of those songs towards the end of the record, if they were, if they stood out in their own way, if they were kind of adding to the the narrative of the album or the, the overall themes of the album, if they weren't just feeling like padding. Um, yeah. That's my only issue with the album is that so much of it feels like padding. Um, and yeah, I have already said that. that, but, that no, that's the thing, Tyler. I, I just want to say one more thing and then I'll shut up about the album because my phone's going to die soon. <laughs> so um, I'll just say this one thing. That is, it was two things really and then I'll shut up but um, the album is 22 tracks long and I listen to it on Spotify or I can like the song with a heart thing which makes Spotify put it in the playlist that they curate for me so when I like it I'm saying to Spotify I want to hear this again right um, and I did that with 10 of the songs and that's an album's worth of songs I liked including one of the instrumentals, um, the first one, because um, it sounded like a Barry Jenkins score. Um, but th- that's still less than half the album, and that's its, th- that's its biggest problem. And even then, and this is a second thing, I love the 1975's debut album. I love it. But there are those three songs on it, um, four even, maybe, um, Robbers, Girls, Sex and the City, and You from the EP, which I still love. And those are five songs that made the beginning of their career. And there is not, and I still like this LP, there is not a single song on this new LP where the songwriting is as good, is as catchy, is as hook-filled, is as emotional as any of those five songs. Yes. I completely and wholeheartedly, I thought you were about to say like you didn't like songs like Sex and Robbers and I was just like, okay, all right, all right. Don't make me come out and defend this fucking band. Yeah, and but... I think another thing that's noticeable about the record as well is that every record of these up to this point has one song on it that you can point at and say, this is quintessential to 1975. This is them. This, is all, this could be the definitive song. On the first record, it's Robbers. On the second one, it's probably somebody else. And on the third one, it's unquestionably love it if we made it. This record doesn't have any songs. No that I like it. People maybe, but even that feels like a weak addition to that canon. It doesn't it's, have any definitive stuff. Y- you are 100% correct. And I feel like, like even as, like, as Sarah just said, I like one of my notes is literally, there is a 30 minute good album in this. It's just that 50 minutes of it is infuriating. Yeah. And it's just like, it is so lopsided. It is so schizophrenic. And it is just like, I, I can't, it feels like bad because I feel like I'm picking on like a, a grade schooler. Because Tyler, you said before we recorded this <laughs> segment that the 1975 are incredibly easy to hate. And you're right, they are. So I pride myself on the fact that I didn't fully hate them until this. Like, I like the first album. I like the second album. I think the third album is just boring. That's that, like, it, I, I don't have a negative opinion on this album is just everything. It is every bad thing about them culminated into being most of an experience. And then it's just amplified and it is annoying. And it is like, and it's also just not as well produced as the first two albums. I don't understand why it isn't. It, it really perplexes me as to why the mixing on some of these tracks, especially with the bass is so weak. And I, I, I don't get that. It's like when you have it was recorded in 16 different studios. Jesus I saw Christ, that, why? which makes so much sense. Oh. Why would you say do record, that? I, I can tell you why, because they wrote it on tour. So they kind of recorded it on tour as well. They just stopped at the place they were touring, recorded some songs and moved on. Gosh. <laughs> Idiots. And it has that feeling. It does have that feeling. <laughs> terrible I think that, idea. Wow, that... I think that if you were, if, they, if someone put a gun to their head and said you have to use all these songs, I think that in that situation, they constructed them well, but because that obviously wasn't the case, that they didn't have to put all these songs on the record, it still suffers for it. I feel like I think if it's you as well constructed entire... as it could be with all of those parts being included, but it would unquestionably be better if some of them were removed. They, they do the best with what they have. I, I think in, in their entire discography of all four albums, if you made 
if you gave the 1975 and you said like you have to make one album that is the length of their other albums so let's say you have one album that is like 17 songs long i feel like you could have of all of those songs you could make one near perfect album mm -hmm. it's just that they're amalgamated from four different records yep and I'm just like I'm I'm confused as to why like yeah, because it, when it, they're it's on like a, they're it's like so a box on set. I don't get it's it like, it's like a box set from a more mediocre band that had some one hit wonders yeah precisely see I think they're in in a sense ever since the third album they'll probably only ever really be a singles band for me I don't think you could compile yeah. their songs yeah. because they're so inextricably linked to the cultural moment that they were written in like often often explicitly so so there are singles there but there's first and second albums work really well on their own but ever since then it's been a there've been a singles band and this rollout for this album has encapsulated that like they released like i think something like eight tracks yeah, in advance like of the record and i was following the release of those tracks and i liked every single one of them and it just hit me it's hit me listening to this record that those tracks are were perfectly designed for discovery and play in isolation like each of them are cohesive each of those singles has has is expressing its own idea sometimes the ideas are linked but it's its own thing and then just when you try to mesh them together into this one product it just becomes immediately clear that the songs aren't meant to go together really they're just reflections of the current moment that maddie healy is in when he writes and records the songs and then when when the when this has been done over such a long period of time and they're all kind of being jammed together in this one singular release at this one point in time, it just becomes apparent that, so this is why I'm so, I'm so interested in people's experiences of this record who hadn't heard the singles in advance, um, because I can't imagine how the record would play. Because for me, like, each of those singles is so inextricably linked to the time it came out, especially the early ones, that it's more difficult for me to get fully on board with the record because of, because of the fact that it's hard for me to see those songs in this new context mm -hmm. with the stuff they're surrounded by. That's, right. I mean, that's, that's very understandable. And honestly, like, it makes me feel like kind of a shallow listener that I just like can't latch onto those other songs in that same way. But I just like, like even the songs that I really liked, one thing I noticed about them, like vocally speaking, the way they were, the way they were mixed and the way the production exemplified them, the reason I liked them is because they sounded like Barefaces Brockhampton songs. That's yeah, why I like I them, because they remind yeah. me of better music. So I'm like, yeah, I got nothing. Yeah. And if you wanted to be particularly scathing about the 1975, you could say that that's a uh, a sentence that encapsulates this whole record really uh, there are some interesting ideas that are expressed but it just makes you think of the, the the bands or artists that those ideas are based on and it makes you wish you were listening to them no, yes I, I, I think that kind of encapsulates the band as a whole like even when like the second album I absolutely adore it's one of my favorite albums of all time and even then it's just crypt from Peter Gabriel and Prince like, and um um uh fuck what other comparison did i well actually when my mom heard one of the singles from the second album in the car she was just like i think it was love me she was just like this reminds me of david bowie and i was just like oh yeah, yeah totally yeah. I hear that it's yeah. like totally straight out of um kind of like glam era diamond dogs -ish bowie like it's very very and, clear and like, even love me has like a the... guitar riff on it that sounds just like a george michael song like just like like exactly the same yeah, and there's even like elements of like Talking Heads textured guitars on those yep. early tracks as well, and like yep. Roxy Music stuff. Um, like that whole glam era is like. But the reason why the second album works is that it's not just like, it's not just like a sh shallow songwriting that's dressed up with um, that kind of those kinds of textures. It's all kind of in service of the the 1975's like style and mm -hmm. and Maddie Healy's like lyricism and quintessentially British lyricism about kind of like how uh, he has shit relationships with girls basically and, and Ballad of he, Me and My Brain that's one of my favorite songs of theirs and that oh, on that album it's, it's a great and song. it's such a like clever well structured and very quintessentially like unique song that I genuinely think no one else would have written and it's one of maybe four songs that they've made that I can genuinely say that about.
Yeah, and also the sound is probably the best song yeah. I've ever recorded, in my opinion. That's a quintessential pop song. It's one of my favorite pop songs of the last 10 years, actually. Song it's played at where it. Morgan did a show once for in a music video on the televisions, and I was just like, huh, I should listen mm. to this band. Again. Every time I get to the, the guitar solo and the sound, I'm just like, this is as good as anything I could ever hope from this band. It's a yeah. perfect song. And I just, oh. this record, the new record, just there's nothing that approaches that. No. Mm. Even though I do enjoy it for what it is, it's just been a, it just is hurt by the comparisons to stuff that they've already done, and also the comparisons to the stuff that they try to attempt here, but just just don't do a very engaging job they, with. They no, they can they, make a good song, they just can't make an album with the songs. It's just impossible. Yeah. No, August, just, what are your thoughts? Sorry, I interrupted. I still well, hear what. Wait, August can go first. Okay. I just, I just still haven't really talked about it either. Uh, oh, right. yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess I'm coming from a very different perspective than everyone else because this was the first time I, I had ever heard a 1975 album, let alone a 1975 song. Poor bastard. So, uh, and, and I guess a lot of the reason for that was because I always had this mentality that the 1975 with that band name and the album title notes on a conditional form it, it is exactly what you expect it to sound yep. like that's what it sounds like and I always had the impression I was gonna hate that and I, I wouldn't say I went to that extreme of hating it but e it's just a void of like i can't find anything really to latch on to like i i'd say like my first two listens for this i took pretty extensive notes but by the time i'm on my third listen there is a note that is literally just three periods like i just can't that would be the title of a song they made it would be. I just can't That's manage to, to form any kind of coherent thought on this. Mm -hmm. uh, but like most of what I wrote down was just jokes and punchlines that I thought were kind of funny. Like uh, this one, which I, I teased at earlier. So uh, I, I really wonder why the, the song People sounds like an English language cover of the second Death Note OP. Fuck me, August. You really hit the nail on the head there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, the thing. The second Death Note OP is a better song. No, it's a great song, is the thing. It's it a... fucking rips. Yeah, it does. Oh, Jesus. But this... August, was there anything about the album that stood out to you as especially good or especially bad? Now, there were things that I did like, to be fair. I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, exaggerating this perspective of like, oh, this was the most boring album of the decade. But, uh, I mean, I did like a lot of the... I liked the future garage and instrumental stuff that did... A lot of that really captivated me and i think that's more to do with the fact that i'm a huge fan of those genres than yeah than anything else but i guess and it's kind of for me an opposite perspective but still the same conclusion from from jake of like yeah i i liked the few i just could not stand this album when it was just these really kind of sappy generic pop songs like the one that stood out to me as the worst was the last song guys which just made me want to shove yeah, my that. finger so far down my throat to induce vomit in myself <laughs> just so i could have some some sensation but <laughs> guys being dudes yeah i just there it's just yeah that there's things i like but it just amounts to nothing really because 
as as everyone as like Jake has already said, it's it's an album where it's like it insists upon itself. It really fucking does. Of like <laughs> people, the nineteen seventy five, and then you just follow that up with just a lot of just when you follow that up with just a song about like Matt Healy not being truthful about some like sexual encounter he had it, it's just such a dissonance that i'm like what is going yeah yeah on? yeah that's the thing like it starts out like you think it's going to be this topical record that's like really laser politically focused and then just the whole rest of it is just about matt healy like just his personal life basically. you think yeah. it's gonna be fucking hail to the thief and then it isn't hail to the thief Oh, and you God, know, not I'm just to, imagining how good this would be if it was how to the face. See, it's like, the, and again, I don't mean to stress the Radiohead comparisons, but it's like, it's it's not because the 1975 sounds like Radiohead. They don't. They really don't. It's that they are obsessed with the idea of becoming a Radiohead. They are obsessed mm-hmm. with that cultural zeitgeist that they managed to capture and Radiohead did that because they just didn't care they just started making alternative rock music and then it evolved because that's where their sound took them they weren't trying to be anything they just this made thing, okay like, computer and became Radiohead okay computer was deliberately like the right the songwriting on that record they're deliberately writing about topical things yes about a, a, a paradigm shift in the world that's going on they're not seeking to be the voices of that or the most important they're not seeking to be an important band with that record they're just writing about those things and the music media latched onto it because of course they did see that's the thing it's like when morgan and i were talking recently um i think with zach about how we view politics and art and i'm one of those people who thinks that politics are baked baked into everything but when I listen to a 1975 album, the politics feel purely aesthetic. The politics don't come from a place of humanism. They don't come from a place of struggle. They come from a place of vanity. They come from a place of a, a, a desire to, to, to as appear as though they are something instead of being it. And as a yeah. result, this album ends up being like, this is a, I, I, I hate it when people toss out this complaint and this phrase is, you know, being beaten to death, but this album is the most we live in a society ass shit I've ever heard. Mm. It's just, it's, it, think, it's relentless. I think the last album was much more we live in a society than this one. But okay, I, fair I've enough. Watched, mm. I've watched lots of interviews with Matt Healy because I'm trying to get, like, understand him. Because mm-hmm. I think he is narcissistic. But what Narcissism is compelling. Yeah, no, no, no. Actually, I haven't watched a lot of interviews with him, though. I think the big difference between him and someone like Kanye West, for example, is that I disagree with you, Jake. I think that he is genuine. I think he genuinely cares about the issues he's talking about. I don't think it's really performative, and I don't think it's solely... I think there's definitely elements of vanity in the way things are expressed, but I think he genuinely believes that the things he's talking about are important, that um, he wants his record to be important um, because of what it's about, not just Mm -hmm. because of shallow, superficial things. Like, I genuinely think he cares about climate change. I genuinely think he cares about all the issues he talks about, It's just that the way that it's expressed, the way that the music is dressed up. He he can't um, translate it. Yeah, it just, it just, you're right. Like, it just insists upon itself. See, and that's the thing. He can only, he can only, I, I also, I'm with Tyler on this. I genuinely believe that he feels passionately about everything he writes about but he can only speak about it from his extremely privileged perspective. And as Mm, such, he is the last person we need to be hearing about it from. And that is why the night, the first track and people are just, they're, they're somehow not the worst track on the album because I will get to that in a few minutes. But I what think what you just that, said is a good argument for why the first track might even be the best on the album, which I don't think. But like at least it is like someone already said, mm-hmm. it is just platforming someone and just letting them do their thing, letting Greta Thunberg do her thing. I mean, okay, we can talk about whether the context of that in the album undermines it. I think it, arguably it does, but it's still platforming rather than just Matt Healy talking and saying these things himself. And. That is true, but I can I can only hear the speech in Matt Healy's voice because of the 
the context in which it's being delivered, especially when it's titled the 1975. Yeah. And the fact that it's followed up by people, which is just messaging aside. I think it's a horrifically produced track. It just sounds awful in so many ways. Like I, I, like I can't stand, thank God it's like two minutes and 30 seconds because if it was any longer, it would be like pulling rusty nails out of my ears. I just hate it so much. It's, I, I completely agree with this standpoint, like, wholeheartedly. And I, I think there is, like, there's, there's just, like, I don't know what you're going to say the worst song is, but I'm very curious to see just because, like, I, yeah. I dislike the record to a point where the things that I all hated just sort of blended in together and I couldn't pick out one. That being said, I am curious. But I just... There, there is something about the way that, like, it, it just, it feels like the, their sound and their insistence on being important to me is always just, like, not that I'm saying you inherently can't do it, but, like, when they're trying to be this, like, poppy and even more introspective and slow band, it's just, like, when you try to make this important music, it just feels so diametrically opposed, and it gives me, like, whiplash, and I'm just, like, I don't know what you're trying to accomplish here, what feeling I'm supposed to feel. You are preaching to the choir so much. Like, who in your audience doesn't think this? Who listens to the 1975 and doesn't think all of these things that you're saying? No one! And and ultimately, that's why I'm okay with the album, because it drops that after two songs, which is damning it with fine praise if ever there was a case of that. Because the rest of it is just inane and meaningless. Yeah. Yeah. But I... My hatred would be stronger if it was like that. Yeah. No, and yeah, let's, it's, let's get to it's more funny. Than I think. Mm. It's, it's funny because I think I find, personally, I'm much more in August camp of preferring the more uh, ambient instrumental type stuff. Because the, I think Jesus Christ 2005 is pretty good. Mm. I mean, it's like, it's completely salvaged by Phoebe Bridgers. Yes. Just because it's just... Purely because it's a Phoebe Bridgers song that they Her voice saves whole. everything. Of course it, yeah. it's good. Well, I mean, it's just her song, Wholesale, but she didn't write it. And the worst moments on this album to me are songs like The Birthday Party and, uh, Jesus, what's it called? The one that sounds really shoegazy. Uh, it's one of, it's, it isn't on the back goes? half. Oh, then because she goes was the shoe goes track i think and oh yeah that's a, one. yeah it's it's abysmal i hate it because th- the it's production like top three song on the album oh i don't i do not <laughs> understand the production is so awful and it's just it sounds this like genre, uh, sorry well just th- this genre hopping that they do on this album completely ruins any sincerity that it had with me outside of like the ambient tracks and something like if you're shy, let me know if you're too shy. I don't remember. Um, (laughs) Because I like those because it sounds like it's in their wheelhouse. Yeah. And they're just, they're just making stuff that they're comfortable with and it's fun and it's meaningless and it's just pretty decent pop music overall. But like the birthday party and uh, the shoegaze song and specifically the track that I hate the most road kill Mm. Specifically ah. when they're tr- specifically when they are trying to write Americana type stuff is just so infuriating. One of the worst songs on there. I will absolutely give you that. See, the thing is, for me, like uh, it's particularly those three songs, particularly um, the birthday party and uh, then because she goes. I think they really like. I really like them because I think that they kept. They they do do a very specific. Um, different genre that the band are normally used to that's their thing but they they have a, both have a really dreamy quality to them and roadkill does as well even though the songwriting on that track i agree is abysmal like i think they all have an, a really dreamy quality to them that um makes them feel like 1975 songs by the time you get to the end of them at the very least um and i mean the other song as well like i'd have uh, me, me and you together song like that is, feels like classic 1975 even though it's like yeah i really like that rush song. 90s. um i just i like the fact that most of the time when they genre hop by the time the song's over it does start to f- it has either started to feel or it's it's 
felt for an extended time like you can hear them in it and they're kind of adjusting to that they're either adjusting to the genre hole they're kind of trying to fill or they they have adjusted and those songs just to work for me especially they work for me more and more the more i listen to the record because they start to feel like logical extensions of of um, the band's sound just filtered through their vision of a different genre. The, where the record loses me is where they continue to beat the horse of a genre that they know how to do um, because they don't know what else to do with the record except, for to, except to continue beating that horse. If they did like five um, birthday parties or five Then Because She Goes tracks or even five um, tracks in the instrumental style of Roadkill, I would be equally pissed off. Um, it's just that um, yeah, I just, yeah, I, I no, think that they I, I do understand. adopt to this general genre styles fairly well. It's just that they don't vary the songwriting and the stylistic variation is not enough for it to sustain 22 tracks. No, that's absolutely a problem too. It's just not what infuriates me the most because yeah. I just, it just sounds so artificial to me. And part of it's the production and part of it's just that I, I feel like they're just doing it because they can. And it just doesn't, it just yeah. rings completely hollow to me. And yeah. I, don't, I don't think there's a more appropriate microcosm of the album as a whole than the line in Roadkill where Matt Healy drops a homosexual slur. Yeah. That's, that's, oh, that's unforgivable. What song that was in? Yeah. 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 Could not remember for the life of me when that happened. No, there's there's no justification for that. It's the same thing as a white person saying the yeah. N word because they've what been called it, it especially, before. Like obviously it's awful. And what makes it especially egregious for me, and this is one of my this is probably my least favorite aspect of Matt Healy's songwriting, is that he continually, like repeatedly tries to um I don't know, he tries to he doesn't do this explicitly, but like he's obviously like a straight guy, but he tries to like I don't know, perform uh, gender, perform like gender nonconformism in a really kind of uh, like weird way that just feels like really hollow. Really, really glad you said that just because as, you know, as somebody who does not abide by the traditional gender spectrum, it was very, just almost concerning for me to learn that he wasn't because I was yeah. under that impression and I was just like, it was only because I had seen him in interviews and listened to his music. And then finding yeah. that out, I was just kind of like, it's different because it's like, like David Bowie, for example. David Bowie did the exact same thing, but it was because David Bowie was actually an incredibly sexually fluid person. That man, yeah. he like, he did enough cocaine and fucked enough people in the 70s to have like, like, he could have made his own space colony somewhere, I'm sure, if he had worn condoms, or hadn't worn condoms, or, you know, whatever. I, what, who cares? But the thing is, is that it just, it feels like he is trying to adhere to these things because it is what is expected of a band like him and the image that yeah. he projects, and not because it's something authentic to him. Like, that experience yeah, just... is not spoken for, and it feels really, really uncomfortable for me specifically. Yeah, there are so many songs, not even just on this album, where he's like talking about like, oh, this person thought I was gay, and like that's it. Like, what are you? What's your point? Uh huh. Yeah, like, you're not. You're not oppressed because people think you're gay, dude. Shut up. No. Yeah. It's, this is why. This is why Jesus Christ works because it's a song about being queer in America. Yes. He gets Phoebe Bridges to sing that part of the song. He doesn't just like sing it himself. Because yeah. he's British and he's not queer, so it's like, you know, why are you even writing this song? And then Phoebe, and Phoebe is says, authentic. Phoebe, Phoebe sounds like Phoebe is a folk singer songwriter, which is inherently like you just don't think that you can be able to work that kind of identity into that sound and make it sound natural. But she does because she's a good fucking songwriter. So when she does yeah. it on that track, it feels natural. If he was singing that part, it would just be like. Uh, yikes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I do think yeah. the song is really good, though, and it works because he makes that acknowledgement and he his part of the song is singing, because the song is about basically like the Healy's perception of the experience of growing up in Christian America, um, mm. not conforming to, like, either whether it's the religion itself or whether it's to, se like, sexual, normal, the sexual norms of sexuality. 
And so like he talks about like the religious aspect and then he gets Phoebe to come on and talk about the um, sexual aspect. And it just works because it's a beautiful song and it's, it's well composed and it's, you know, it understands its own limitations. And I also, yeah. I also find the perspective with which he talks about America kind of insulting not because he's wrong about anything he's saying it's just because there's a sense of superiority with it because he's english when yeah england mm-hmm. is just as bad in all the ways that we are just on a smaller yeah. scale yeah. and also just as a small greg you should not be attempting to write americana if you're not american i i, I don't disagree with that frankly like i feel like like it works for not, dire not straight because it's, it's just that like it, it just it's very hard to do without coming off as blanketly appropriative and just like whatever which is how it yeah. came across to me here it's just like you are stealing the aesthetic of a song and nothing more and it therefore it feels like nothing to me yeah but i i should rephrase because it has worked before with dire straits specifically but that's because mark knopfler was deeply influenced by blues and americana to begin with but from the beginning, the 1975 is cribbing from 80s British New Wave. It's just not something they can pull off, I think. At least not yet. They're not at the talking heads level where they could just do a song like Big Country and just make it work. Like, that doesn't, yeah. they're not at that stage yet. This is why I'm so interested in the fact that, that Matt Healy says this is the end of the era. Like, I'm very curious to see, like, what happens next for the band. Like, what they try to do next because just makes um, an album exactly like the ones he's been making. Like I, yeah, I, I genuinely mean, I feeling, think that's what's going to happen. No, I, I have I, a feeling it will be something like that, but I want, I'm curious to see like what happens because it will be, it will probably color the way that I view this record in the future to some extent. Yeah. That is, that I also I find it interesting that this is meant to be like a sort of end of era, era album when they play with stuff that they never played with before. If it's supposed to be a summary then why are you introducing so many new half-baked ideas? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just, I don't know. I think because oh, uh, this record was supposed yeah. to be paired with the last one, so I think that if they did the same approach with the last one, even though I didn't like this, a lot of the individual songs on it, if they just stuck to the same kind of like 15-track thing, then you could have a pair of like sibling records that perhaps, um, uh, you know, complement each other nicely. Whereas this is supposed to be a companion piece to that record, but it feels like in so many ways just completely unlike it. And just, except for the moments where it's just deliberately taking a song off that record and just redoing it. Yeah, think of the band because they that feel like, like they don't have enough time to feel. Like what band has accomplished what the 1975 wants to do? Because I know there's a group that like has been able to authentically embody problems and sounds of like the music industry, but also like like there's a band that has like done this in a way that does not ring as bad. <laughs> like, and I can't think of who it is, but like there's somebody like like a rock band or or something that like maybe even like even even a band like the Menzingers. Have have come from a place where it's like their last album has that first song on it, uh, "America, You're Freaking Me Out," where they just express their complete and utter dismay at the situation. Like they don't even comment on things politically; they just are are like completely confused and do not know what to do or how to do anything. And they express this so very genuinely. And like everything about the Menzinger songwriting feels like it comes from a place of personal struggle. Like every sing- like every song on After the Party feels like a vignette. Like there's a, like everything that happens on Bad Catholics, I, on, I 100% believe that all of those things happen to that guy because they also happen to me. Like I get it, I've felt that before. And it's distinctly also, American. Um, yeah, I think that uh, Sleep Well Beast by The National expresses a lot of this really well as well. It's a political record without mm-hmm. being like political. Like it's ostensibly the narrative Humanist. of that record. Ostensibly the narrative of that record is kind of like marital discord in a world where like communication is instant, but the world is also falling mm-hmm. apart around you. So like, how do you, deal with, how do you fix the relationship with your partner that you're having how you how do you deal with the process that when everything around you is also turning to shit 
like, and that person is all you have to hold on to while that's happening. That's a great record that I think, and yeah, that's a record I think does that kind of like commentary on the times really, really, really well without trying to be like the self-important indulgent thing. yeah that's that's the problem is that like you mentioned kanye earlier and the funny thing about kanye's music is that like he did sort of speak to a a, a moment in america and i think his first two records because they very distinctly come from a place where he is like rapping like all of his bars are about how college is bullshit about how in, especially in the black community and in like poorer communities that they are like, the, the, the education in general is put on this pedestal when all of these other things are, are happening and, and affecting them. And it's like this completely unfair thing. And it really comes from a place where you feel like he's experienced this. Like when he, when he raps about his mom, that's something that you feel like he did. And then as his career sort of evolved, he became a bit more egocentric and then everything sort of became about him and he stopped speaking to that. The problem with the 1975 is that they're trying to have Kanye's ego and balance it with trying to be a thing about the people. They're trying to be the moment. They're trying to be, and, and there's there's no way you can equate that without sacrificing every, every one for the is, other. Every album is trying to be my beautiful dark twisted fantasy. But yes, it's, it's, by, it's trying to be a beautiful dark twisted fantasy and the college dropout at the same yeah, time. No. And the end result is graduation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nailed That's that. Pablo. Yeah. Uh, Pablo too. Pablo where yeah. it's just like you're trying to get this like relevant like voice thing and it just comes off as vague and then like all of the personal experiences come off as hollow and all of the like gaudy audaciousness just comes off as ugly and, and mm. it leaves you with nothing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, like, you have to go for broke. You can't compromise or else the vision isn't it. Like, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, for all my problems with that album, it is it is a glitzy, indulgent, uncompromising album that is the way it is because it, it wants to be that. And my problem is just with that it is that. It's it's good at that. But, and, and my problem here is that it's just, this one is so schizophrenic. It's just like, am I trying to be this? Am I trying to be that? I don't know. Who is, who, when, where, why? Like, there's just no, like, you know, really the, 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 the band that is, it's trying to be is, or not even the band is that the album it's trying to make is the Saturation Trilogy, where it's these like homegrown experiences of people that you were like, oh, okay. And you get it. Like just except, hip hop in general. Except Healy yeah. is trying to be every single member of Brockhampton. <laughs> yes, it's it's um, he's a, a British like rich dude is trying to be the the lower class members of society, and it's just like, no, this this doesn't work. He he's trying to approach it from hip hop sensibilities, like not even just Brockhampton. People like Denzel Curry, people like fucking Odd Future and Frank Ocean, like all of these people who are like like Matt Healy thinks he's Frank Ocean. He really does. Frank Ocean does all of the same shit that Matt Healy does, except he makes it work. That's all I'm saying. You want to know another record that went totally under the radar that I recently discovered that has all the same kind of ambition as a 1975 record, but is just consistently excellently written and well-performed, is Go Father in Lightness by the Gang of Youths. Yes. And um, yes. it's obviously, obviously that perspective is influenced by me having just discovered that record recently. And it's now one of my favorite records of all time. Um, and I think that, that connection to me was also made when the third song on notes, uh, the end music for Cars, sounds identical to one of the interludes on that album. Like it, it has the same kind of like massive string melody that's just kind mm. of really like cinematic. Mm -hmm. And it sounds exactly like one of the interludes on that record. And the difference is, on notes, it serves no purpose no. at all. Mm -mm. Like it's just, you could put it anywhere on that record and it would be equally out of place. Who even says it's there an interlude? A... Like, it's just like a, it's an amalgamate of sound. Yeah. It could be an interlude. There's, and on, on Go Father and Lightness, all of those interludes are either narratively relevant or they're just necessary as transitions between mm -hmm. two particular sounds. Yeah. Like, it's very purposeful Absolutely. on an album like that. Whereas here, it's just like, well, I think clearly the, the song was put there because going from people to frail state of mind would be too much of a, too jarring, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But like the decision to put something so bombastic 
uh, in between them is really funny to me because it kind of kills uh, your it kills it really like I don't know what a better transition would be between those two songs, but it kind of emblem it's kind of emblematic of how like um, what a f- fucking whiplash this record gives you at certain points. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So uh, who? Oh, we just we just at length compared notes on a conditional form to go farther in lightness. <laughs> so uh, do we really have anything else to say? No, I'm good, honestly. I'm no, honest. I said my piece. All right. Yeah, we've so, uh, long enough. Let's, let's start looking forward with... to never thinking about this again. Yeah, I mean, like this, I will never revisit. Let's like, start ever. with Tyler. What would you give this album? Why, why we start with me with the ratings both times? Because um, it's funny. Uh, I would give this album a, a seven, seven out of ten. All right. Now I am going to read what Sersha gave this. This she kind of wrote this little thing for us. Mm. So I would say that it's only fair because I only found half of the album listenable. I couldn't give it above a five out of 10. And even then, that half of the LP was only really an eight out of 10 anyway. So a four out of 10 seems appropriate. I, yeah, I like that. I like and that. she also wrote uh, this little piece. Uh, you know my social media, but I'd ask you also read out that if people want... They can find my film reviews at a fistful of films as well. That is true. Good website. Good website. Good writers. Yes. So, yeah. so Morgan. You know, I, going into this, I was thinking of five out of ten, but I just. Oh God, it's really. It gets worse every time I think about it. I thought this would see. You, see what I mean? <laughs> like I, th- I feel like it. Let's uh, let's call it a f- let's call it a four and a half out of ten. All right. So yeah. I'll I'll go. I'm I'm just gonna say because I struggle to have any feelings on it one way or another. I'm just gonna go like a, a light five. That's all I can muster up. Jake. Jake's about to give it the life itself. Uh, see, that's the thing is that it's like for 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 all of my uh, my how how I did like hate it and and whatnot. I I am I feel even with albums, I I only tend to listen all the way and fully form opinions on albums that I like because I just don't like listening to music that I don't like listening to. Uh, so that being said, you know sometimes might sound harsh, but I would give this like a light to decent three, Ooh. and I think that's fair. It leads considering my thoughts, uh, oh, like because yeah. like is it a two? No, it's not like it, it, it's not like a you know, and it's not a one. It's not like a speeding bullet to heaven kind of deal. It's, it's just not, like it's, it's not, not an Eminem album. No, it's no. It, oh. yeah, it's it, oh fuck no, it's not. Uh, <laughs> oh, you just made me think of the new Eminem album. So for the I'm so sad that gotta... the Eminem album came out before we started doing this, so mm. we couldn't like tear it. I through. I would have gone feral on camera like it's so uh, funny I, i'm what's convinced so funny it's about, his worst album convinced yeah, exactly what's so funny about this new album is that everyone has been saying oh you know it's, it's actually quite good like relative to his recent stuff and i'm you just here thinking no, no it's terrible it's like worse than the last one. i would rather listen to revival i really would i really really would okay, okay what so. a what a note to end this on yeah we got uh, a uh, four, uh, uh, your rating you gave your rating a, the average rating is a 4.7 out of 10. Oof. Yeah, that's fair. So I had, I'm sorry, I had absolutely no recollection that Eminem released an album this year. <laughs> yeah. Like, none. Yeah. It was like, are we talking about Kamikaze right now? <laughs> I mean, it was bad. But yeah, like, but Kamikaze's like a four or five out of 10 bad. Like, it's, it's easily his best of his bad records. Kamikaze he's to be murdered by his... Kamikaze is a four until you get to Venom, where it becomes a negative four. <laughs> Venom. Venom, Venom is a meme. It's like, it is impossible to ingest it as anything other than a meme. Just, Venom! Venom. Go get him! No, I'm not gonna go what hit him. <laughs> okay, All right, perhaps, so that's, perhaps, yeah, that's yeah. the podcast.
Uh, we'll save that for when we do a special episode of like our least favorite albums of the year or something which i uh, have plenty of candidates for already yeah so uh yeah Uh, that's all i guess Uh, that that is all um we should do our twitter handles where to find all of us tyler where can we find you uh well i have two twitter handles because i'm a pretentious bastard so um, well it's helpful though especially for this you can follow me just i'll just give my main one and you can find mm-hmm. my music twitter by looking at my bio so my main one is at queer denise uh and yeah i talk about movies on that account mostly or i'm just basically talking shit about film twitter mm-hmm. if i'm not talking about movies and then uh my uh, other music my music account is linked in the bio for that account and i basically give takes there as well on the music. highlight sad yeah. the highlight sad yeah so I'll, I'll do searches real mm. quick. Hers is at the llama blogs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then there's so, a fistful of film, which is her yes. writing. And then Morgan, where can we find you? Uh, mine's just Deatley Morgan. Just my yeah. name, but with my last name first. Yes. And just... you can find me at Sabbath Sky and... That's pretty much it. And this is going to be on our YouTube channel and, you know, comment below, whatever. I mean, if you, you know, if there's an idea you all have for like a potential episode topic, we're receptive. This is not a a set thing. We are not like set in our ways or anything. This is a very loose thing, as you may have guessed. We Mm. we want to tighten our structure and be a little bit more, you know, efficient as we go along. We're probably not going to have five people on every single episode. Uh, but yeah, that's yeah. Oh, wait, and we're wait. probably not going to talk for this long on your recent clips. Yeah, so. yeah. To, to be yeah. fair, we had a one album that was eighty minutes long, which you know, yeah. it, 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 with dissenting opinions, and then we had an album where we had like literally just every single possible opinion you could have, just <laughs> ranging. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you um, could listen to the 1975 album in the in the time it takes uh, to talk to about us to get to that album on this podcast. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, yeah, but we we're far more entertaining than that album. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I, I'm right. willing to say that I'm more entertaining than Matt Healy. I'm not very confident, but I can say that much. I think yeah. I think you're more entertaining than Matt Healy. And by the way, I, I, I think you're more good looking than Matt Healy too. All of you are more good looking than Matt Healy. Well, I mean, stupid Jesus. hair. One thing you can find me uh, at uh, at Adam Sandler. Why? <laughs> I, I found an Adam Sandler tweet in my feed, and that's why. Well, congratulations. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, little did you all know, this is actually a, a method performance uh, for the new Safdie Brothers film. Yeah. <laughs> Unfriended oh, oh, 3. <laughs> oh, no, I can't believe I did it. I turned into a pickle, oh, no. <laughs> It's the funniest that. shit I've ever seen. <laughs> oh no, this is, I can't do the voice. I was gonna <laughs> you did a good job. Oh no, this dude 1975 album is fucking terrible. <laughs>